take a seat. <laughs> okay, I'd like to call to meeting uh, to, um, to order the Education, Technology, and Policy Committee of August 15th, 2023. And I'd like uh, Mr. Board to uh, do the Father God, we come to you tonight and we're thankful for all the beautiful faces we see in the crowd. We're thankful for this opportunity to work in service for the people, let us be good stewards of the people's money, and let us work together to find solutions to the problems that are at hand. Thank you for this day. Thank you for this wonderful weather. In your name we pray. Amen. <coughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Consideration of approval of the wise policy file E 1.1C school and student safety. This is also part of board thought, which is um, a program that we do, uh, all school systems do in Louisiana, and we have suggested policy changes and we uh, typically adopt all of those changes. So moved. Moved by Mr. Ford, second by myself. Um, would you like to uh, tell us a little bit more about this particular change to policy? Um, sure. Basically, it states, Ms. Bill, uh, it kind of irons out how or which steps need to be taken when certain types of threats, things like that, are done, whether it involves personnel on campus or to campus. Just something, frankly, in my opinion, I think we already do these things. It's just a matter of policies kind of catching up the world we're in. Yeah. I know. It, uh, read those policy changes, a lot of it was just taking out some words and, you know, it really wasn't a, uh, anything drastic that, uh, as far as the change was concerned. Okay, do I have anyone in the audience that would like to address this? Um, Mr. Ford? No, you basically summed it up when you, you introduced the, the uh, proposal. This is from Fort Thought and, you know, 99 out of 100 times we accept their policy change as is because they're the experts on the legal written law and how it affects us. So um, reading through it, just like you said, there's not much change. It's just a little verbiage here and there. But it kind of gives you, it's, it's an eye opener for the state of affairs right now. We're having to deal with these kinds of policies, you know, not just the general public, but the school system. kind of sucks. Yeah, so that one, it deals with hybrid uh, learning if a kid is on computer-based learning or, or if they're in person. We don't really have, a, we have a very limited amount of kids that are involved in that. And that's usually kids who are home for various reasons who are uh, alternative program. But for the most part, kids are not, we don't really have a hybrid program, to say the least. Do you think they, they did this in consideration of what we experienced with COVID sure. and that possibility of that coming about uh, again? how we would actually manage attendance in those periods of time if we had to do that. Yes, ma'am, I so. Moved by Mr. Ford, second by myself. Um, any public comment? Mr. Ford? Any board members? Any reactions? Mm -hmm. Yes, no, so moved. Um, next, also Mr. Talbert, the um, consideration of approval of the last policy about HS 2.1A student absences and excuses. Okay, this one uh, specifically looks at students who misses for uh, mental health. Um, 
this too definitely to me is not really a major change because if a kid comes in with enough excuse, it's already excused. So probably the biggest challenge is, is that after two days, if a kid is out for that reason, that or to link them up with a social or a council type person on campus. So probably the bigger challenge for us is just going to be knowing that that's why the student's out. Because uh, obviously with these things, a lot of times people aren't very forthcoming with this. So, but obviously when we're aware of it, we will be possible. Okay, here too, it does specify K-5, to but I want to emphasize not only for you guys, but the public as well. K-12, to uh, we have personnel that stand in the carpool lines or the crossing walks and things like that. So this is a safety issue that's taken across the board. But obviously, if there's uh, really common sense type things that kids aren't allowed to walk when they have sport, that type of thing. Uh, when they run about the cars and making sure cars are stopped and so forth. So it simply spells out what measures need to be taken again. Those, those measures are being taken in the systematic policy to catch up the world. Okay. Uh, yeah, so moved. Moved by Mr. Ford, second by myself. Um, any public comment? Mr. Ford? I just want to say kind of echo what Mr. Ford said. This has always been a common practice that was different in every school that you go to. So now we're just kind of setting a standard and saying this is what has to be done. And, uh, and I think it's good to have guidelines and Mr. Ford, second by myself. Any public comment? Mr. Ford? 
Any board members? Any objections? So moved. Uh, next, consideration of approval of revised policy F, uh, file, sorry, V-11.6, teleconference, remote participation in school board meetings. Um, Superintendent, all right, this policy, Ms. Benoit, is, is a remote participation by a board member with a disability. So it allows them to participate virtually um, and us have to see this through a And we didn't have that before. We never were faced with how to do that. We have capabilities, so we never uh, had to do that. Yeah. Okay. So, so yeah. Uh, second by myself. Any public comment? Any board members? So this, if you guys recall, right at the beginning of COVID, when we had some issues with the board members, like myself, having COVID, I couldn't make it to an actual meeting, this could have been something that we could have, you know, that would have helped to support. So this is good to have in place. Uh, it's just unfortunate that we had to go through COVID and I had to, to you know, figure it out, but now, we, now here we are. So. And you would actually have attended that meeting. No, didn't vote yet. Uh, public comment. Any more comments? Any board members? Any objections? Okay. 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 Well, there's one issue on that one. On the last one we just voted on, what is it? You can address this. It's a state of emergency. If the governor declares a state of emergency, that goes into place. It's, it's only in that case then. Yes, it says okay. specifically. And the meetings that follow have to be addressing issues relative to our reaction to taking those. Okay. So it's not meant to be just so. If you have a disability yeah. or if you get in an accident, you no, can't that, necessarily participate. There's a separate issue of disability. Okay. That particular one has to do with state emergency. Like when we shut down, the hurricane, COVID, and all that was, you say emergency. No, we can have an alternate meeting where but it's not just so, you know, feel like I'm meeting, you can just log in. Accommodate an individual. Well, yeah, it was, the law is not written to provide that. Okay, sure, yeah. Well, thanks for that clarification. I appreciate it, Mr. Bell. Um, okay, next is consideration of approval of revised policy file F-10.17, time schedules, non-instructional, uh -uh. No, you skipped number 10. Oh, I checked that out. So I got it. Sorry. Consideration of approval of revised policy B 12.8, public participation. Um, again, just moved on this before, second by myself. Um, Mr. Overall? Yes, ma'am. On, on page two of two of this policy, you see where we added verbiage is. And it's the it's, uh, same as the first one, but it's for members of the public who are involved under the Americans with Disabilities Act. Uh, they can request to participate remotely uh, if you've got to provide services or procedures so that you are able to participate. If given prior notice and can involve uh, service, check out. But it doesn't require an emergency declaration to do this right. for this particular right. So, I did have a question. Did you move that one? Yes. Okay. So my question for this is, uh, at some point in time, we're going to have to, as a board, create a policy. Is that correct? Because more than likely, it'll be, you guys will come up with a procedure, yes. and then it will be presented to the board, yes. to the committee, and then on to the board. Yeah. Okay, so I just wanted to make sure, because this, this is saying that we need to do it, but there's nothing in there what the policy will be. Okay. And we pretty much have it, and Chris could probably do a, <coughs> put something in there formally. But we, if, if yeah, we, we do that, we're ready, we're prepared. Okay. We can put something formally in there. Thank you. Any public comment? Any board members? Any objections? Any supporters? Any objections? Any supporters? Next is uh, the consideration of approval for revised policy file F-10.17, time schedules are not instructional support personnel. Yeah, it's just updates on uh, our policy. Puts them on how we, how many hours we pay people and who's the coming in, coming in, like you know, the schedule. So no major change. The way we 
how we operate now. Okay. This is what it was. Consideration of approval of a revised policy for pupil progression plan. Um, Dr. Gray. <coughs> yes. Um, you all should have a black binder at your spot. And if you turn to page two, there are the changes that we made um, that we're suggesting for this 2023-2024 school year. So the first one deals with second grade promotional standards, and it's located on page five. And we added some things to that one. So our, it, it has the previous verbiage here. But the change is second graders have to pass English language arts with at least a D, an average of all four nine weeks, and benchmark in nonsense words, correct letter sounds, and whole words read, and be strategic or above in oral reading fluency and oral reading fluency accuracy. Number two, pass math with at least a D average average of all four nine weeks, and 167 days of required school attendance. So we just added that they had to benchmark to be able to go on to, to third grade. So could this <coughs> be um, sort of addressing that legislative piece? That yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. We want to make sure that they can read sure. by the time they get there. Yeah. And, and Dr. Brew, uh, for the audience, uh, nonsense words. I mean, that's, you might be wondering, what is, what is a nonsense word? But that that's really a, verifies if the kid can really That's right. So they can break it down. They can sound out that word and read it whole word. It's not a real word, but there are letters that they should be able to sound out. Moved by Mr. Ford, second by myself. Um, any public comment? Ms. Ford, do you have any questions for me? We did make one more change um, for the high school um, transfers. When students come in, it's in three different places. We put it on three different pages. It says the same thing. But we changed it for students transferring in from out of state, private or pub non public schools or out of the country. They will have their transcripts verified for approved quantity units. Initial placement will be T9 until we can verify what classes they've taken before we just put them into a grade level and you know they may not be ready for those classes. Um, and then again, when we get um, approval of their transcripts, they can either be moved to ninth grade or they may stay in T9. Are there cases where you can't get a transcript from some countries? Yes, like out of the country. Yeah. So um, there were some instances where students were placed in 11th grade and they, they weren't they didn't take courses that uh, they needed previously to be prepared for those leap tested courses like Algebra 1 and English 1. So you put them back? Well, we didn't, this, we didn't but the, hopefully this will prevent us from um, scheduling those kids in those types of courses. Teachers 
who have earned a rating of highly effective according to the value added model in the previous year. So that means that only teachers who are highly qualified based on BAM can have only one observation. And so you probably hear about that because in the past, if they may, even if it was an elected person, if they were highly qualified, they only had to have one evaluation. Where now, everyone has to have two um, observations, I'm sorry, everyone has to have two observations unless they're highly qualified based on them. We decided for four of us to just kind of give you an overview of, of what we've been doing the last few weeks to prepare for school. And first of all, I want to thank the staff with all of our supervisors and directors who rolled up their sleeves and went out and about. We were on all the campuses. Well, we have been since school started. Um, we were monitoring all of the buses and the car riders and the walkers and riders. We were all assigned schools. And we spent our first week doing that early in the morning and then in the, the afternoons. And just visiting the schools, um, we haven't started our formal, e our, our evaluation process that we do as a staff in the schools. We're not gonna start that until mid-September. But we've just been going into the schools to offer support to the teachers, principals, all of the staff members, just to kind of question how are things going, what do you need assistance with? So just wanted to kind of give y'all an update of what we've been doing. Mr. Butler. Good evening. Uh, last committee meetings that we had, I kind of briefly talked about our second chance program, which we will be targeting kids and students, students in grades one through four. Uh, basically, it's a day treatment program for students that hadn't been identified. However, uh, this past week, during the course of uh, the week, our two teachers that were selected participating in trainings with the social workers that we have overseeing those two programs. And last week, they were trained in program fidelity. Uh, this week, however, they will be trained in crisis prevention and intervention techniques uh, to be able to de-escalate situations that may potentially come about um, in the event that uh, they need to do some de-escalating for inappropriate behavior. So this week on Thursday and Friday, 17th and 18th, uh, at SEC, uh, the teachers will be participating in that training that will be hosted by the two social workers that have been selected for the program. Other teachers of the district also will have an opportunity to, uh, to participate in training as well. Just wanted to let you guys know. That's great. Yeah. Uh, any questions? Yes. Mr. <coughs> Uh, directed to Mr. Olson, but I'll, I'll ask Mr. Butler if he might have the information, or maybe the information is designated already, I was already. What are our numbers uh, so far as uh, students uh, enrolling in our schools compared to that? Do you have figures on that, Mr. Olson, do you have the numbers? I'm oh, sorry, numbers on The numbers, how many? 15,000, 16,000, what, what's the enrollment? 14 and a half, I think. Yeah, so it's 14. How is that compared to that? Still, we still expecting some more. Well, we have students that are coming in and enrolling still. So, yeah. uh, and that's an ongoing process throughout the school year. However, uh, in reference to our 
thin they come. Um, students are still coming in, um, parents are still coming in. So outside the terrorists are still registering students here, and as well as uh, secretaries of the school are still registering students. Um, so um, okay. we probably uh, have a better figure uh, in 10 days. That's, and I think we had a discussion today, and, and it is, you know, uh, it's a big difference from 25 years ago when it was almost 20,000. And you want to show you exactly how we are kind of, kind of more like downsizing. I mean, it's just, it's just amazing, you know. Okay, I was just curious to find that actually knows why. And what, one of the numbers we looked at was um, we lost about 1,200 kids after Ida, and, and we never came back. You know, we were kind of expecting that we get a, a resurgence of, it, it, it actually, each year since I, I mean, this is only a couple of years, declined even more. Not slightly, but still a decline. So we never really regained what we lost. Thank you, Mr. Butler. Thank you, Mr. Butler. Mr. Mark. Yes. Uh, I mean, just a comment on that. Hopefully, when our new school is built, it will be back up and running. We get these students back and back and forth. Hoping that's what could happen. That would be great. Uh, next is uh, Kim Murphy. So, uh, Lakash, Salt Terrebonne. The first day was uh, a little hectic. Um, Dr. Gotro and Juliet did a very good job of sending out procedures to parents, but a few didn't follow it. So it made a uh, first day a little difficult. We met after a, a school massage on Mr. Dillard, and we made the decision to start letting the buses out at seven instead of seven ten. And the next day it was smooth as silk. So it seemed like just letting them out a, a little earlier got rid of the cars. And I mean, Mr. Wazan, you know, there's always been a country drive. It, it, it's it's always been backed up. This is nothing new just because we added the school. It, we've always had that. But now everybody's in there before 720, before school starts, and everything's smooth. So, yes, well, I shared with a couple of board members uh, that a parent, a parent had been contacting us when the first day of school was a mess. It was. Um, <laughs> But it, after about two, three days, they reported that traffic flow has been excellent. It's been great. It's been really good. So, you know, adding those, those 10 minutes, I think it made a big difference. And there were some bu some areas that weren't getting buses that added to a lot of parents having to bring their kids to school, which was right. adding to the car line. So just a couple additional buses and, and made the world a difference. And follow procedures. And follow yeah. procedures. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, Ms. Volplan and Mr. Dillard and staff, uh, Mr. Tarbert, uh, just just excellent work monitoring and, and supplying suggestions. And hats off to the two administrators, Dr. Gotro and, and Ms. Ms. Gotro. I mean, they they made some major adjustments that that were needed. They saw the situation, adjusted simple little things that saved major congestion and, and lots of minutes in taking. They've been on time morning and afternoon for the last three days. Like, like Kim said, very, very smooth. So thank you guys. And thank you board for, for suggesting and, and, and getting involved in that. It helped us out a lot. Giving us and relaying those messages to us that really was beneficial. So we really knew what, what you paid for. That helped to me. Okay, finally we have Michelle Grease. Right now, we have about 675 registered, and we've received an additional 25 applications since Friday afternoon. And what's your limit coming? So we're at about 700, but we have seats for 770 eligible, but we can currently hold up to about 952 kids. So we still have room on east side and west side locations. So I have no fear that if they're coming, we will be able to place them. In fact, we placed everyone, even over income, that have applied. Um, the last couple of ones were today, because tomorrow the um, pre-K girls start. 
So all of those that have applied are quit. Do you have a typical dropout rate on those kids? I, I really wouldn't know. It's I know that bad. normally, September, October, November, December, we tend to increase. After January, we see a tendency drop. And we are funded monthly based on our head count, right? Yeah. Okay. Well, I think that what we've done as a district so far, like I said, last year, we've actually did this um, at the home of Jim, where we did um, J calls. We sent out flyers for families of our different populations, our McKinney Vento, our migrant, our Indian, where they, they could come pick up summer stuff, they could come pick up uniform vouchers, school mm -hmm. supply vouchers, all for this year. We did that in April. We also have pre-K <coughs> set up there to be able to register any younger siblings, any family members that would come to this because we had a, a large turnout to that event. We've done a lot of J calls and we found, we found that this year adding those J calls, we get a little influx of applications once we do one of those reminder J calls. We've, we actually have a billboard up. Um, <laughs> I know, <laughs> I, I mean, just yeah, continue to spread the word. Tonight. Just continue to spread the word. Do we have a, a we, or something? We have flyers. We, we have flyers. We, we share things. Yes, I can definitely hook you up with that. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. Great. Okay. <laughs> we'll take it. Uh, are there any particular uh, schools that appear either under enrolled with uh, what you expected or even over enrolled with what you expected? Well, we have two that are full at capacity with their one class. Do Large is full and Grand Caillou Elementary are full. Okay. Um, we added, remember we added, we were going to add five classes, but we added four because we didn't feel comfortable filling that, that um, fifth one at Shriver. We are, we are doing good without filling that fifth one at Shriver. In fact, they still have openings for three. And like I said, we have room at east side campuses as well as west side campuses that we can fit overflow if needed. Great, thank you. Do you have any other board members? Yes, Mr. Wilson. So, you are the great time you are full. Yes. So if there's more kids in that area, so you have, to, you have another right. nearby? Yes, so, nearby. Okay. Which in the past, they pulled to Mulberry, which we have room at Mulberry. And they provide their own kind Yes. Thank you.
test. We're going to call the Finance, Insurance, and Section 16 Lands Committee to order. Uh, we have uh, uh, Mr. Mike Lagarde, uh, President, and myself, Chairman, along with uh, Mr. Greg Harding, Mr. Dane Voisin, Dr. Mabel Traha, Mr. Matt Ford, and Ms. Mrs. Debbie Benoit, Superintendent, and members of the staff. Uh, <clears throat> First up is a matter bearing upon the August 3rd, 2023 Insurance Advisory Committee meeting. Uh, the minutes are there for you to peruse, Mr. Constranza. Uh, there were only two actionable items, and we'll, we'll get into those next, so I'm not going to uh, go into that too much. But basically, uh, like you said, the minutes are attached. If anybody has any questions, we have to ask, uh, answer. And I looked at those minutes. Those minutes fall directly in line with the next two agenda item. If you have any questions, Mr. Constranza can answer them. If not, we'll move on. Okay. Um, item three, uh, matter bearing upon group health claim statistics for the first six months of the 2023 year. We have Brooke uh, Brunet with Hub International here to present that uh, information. Good evening, everyone. Uh, everyone has a copy of the um claims analysis all right so today I'm going to be presenting the uh, first half of the 2023 plan year of the group health plan statistics um, which is January through June and we do have an update through July and a projection through August to give you guys so if we start on page one participations remain stable um, we have about 2600 um, employees on the health plan as compared to 2675 last year so we have stable participation um, Medicare Advantage participations grown a little bit 1078 versus 1058 so we're right at about less than 1% decrease in total plan participation between your um, self-funded plan and the Medicare Advantage plan so we're right at about 3700 lives our medical claims for the first half of the year were at 11,883,833 prescription claims around 7.6 million for a total claims figure of 19,548,000. So for the first half of the year, we're right under $20 million in total claims. Um, we've had $200,000 in specific reinsurance reimbursement. So your high cost claimants that have reached the specific deductible all of those dollars came from the 2022 plan year and uh, spilled over into the 23 plan year. So we got $200,000 in specific reinsurance back. Your pharmacy rebates you'll see in the first half of um, 23 were already at $1.7 million. And that reports only through quarter um, one of 2023. So you'll see in the first six months, we're already at $1.7 million in rebates as compared to only 1.4 in the full prior year. The good news here is even though we're only through half of the year, this month, just this month, we'll get another around $1.1 million in rebates. And again in November, likely a little over another million dollars. So potentially by the end of the year, we'll be, you know, we'll be pushing to, $3.7 million in, the, uh, in this year as compared to only 1.3 in the prior year. So those negotiated pharmacy rebates that we negotiated in the contract for 2023 is gonna help offset the increase in the claims cost. So those pharmacy negotiations are definitely gonna help the plan out. From a net claims perspective, we're right under 18 million at 17,652,000. Total fixed costs, the cost of running your plan, right at about 940000 So total group health plan costs for the UMR um, health comp plan, $18,592,000 for the first half of the year. We have 1,435 retiree members on the Medicare Advantage plan. The Medicare Advantage premiums total 279383 if we add in the Save Our Ex Retiree Medicare Drug Plan at a little under uh, or a little over a million, a million forty-two, the Retiree Medicare Advantage plans cost in the district one million three hundred twenty-one thousand. 
total plan costs when we look at the UMR health comp plan and the retiree Medicare Advantage plan, total plan cost is 19 million. 913,000 for the first half of 23. If we look at this on a per employee or per um, employee per month figure, medical claims are up 8.3% at $545 per employee per month versus 503,000. Prescriptions are up 22.2% um, at $390 per employee per month versus $319,000, $319 per employee per month. Total plan costs were up about 7.7% as compared to last year. The good news is, this is data through June, if you flip the page to the monthly report, which is page two, this will give you an update through July. July was a good month, um, so it brought our plan costs down from the 7.7% increase um, down to 5.9. So as of July, we're at a 5.9% increase at $879 per employee per month. If we project out August using a conservative projection, um, looking if we look at medical claims, they average around 1.7 million, pharmacy about 1.5. We have a, a little over a million dollars coming in pharmacy rebates in the month of August add in fixed costs, Medicare Advantage. We should have a good month in August. So at the end of August, projection show will be down to only about a 2.5% increase over prior year. So as these rebates come in and flow in through the plan, it'll continue to offset the increased medical costs and pharmacy costs. So the pharmacy negotiations we did for the 2023 plan years are doing its job in helping stabilize that cost. Do you guys have any questions so far? Okay. The next page is only the prior year monthly report just for comparison purposes if you'd like to look that over. So if we move on to page four, your medical claims as I mentioned are up this year about 8.3%, but we're still 12% below the five year average. So we're still doing really good there. Um, the majority of the cost and the increase in medical is coming from high cost claimants. We did have an increase in high cost claimants. So we had an increase in inpatient, um, inpatient stays. Inpatient claims are up 73%. And when you see inpatient claims up that much, the majority of the time it's coming from those higher cost claimants who had uh, long-term inpatient stay. So if we move on to page five, Prescription drug claims are up, as I mentioned before, about 22.2%. Um, majority of that increase is coming from an increase in diabetic uh, drug utilization, as well as increased anti-inflammatories. That's those drugs you see advertised on TV every night to treat um, psoriasis and Crohn's disease. Um, but we have seen a huge increase in diabetic meds. Um, I know, I know, it, kind of the talk of the town, people taking those diabetic drugs to treat um, or for weight loss versus what they are FDA approved for, which is to treat type 2 diabetes. So we do have rules in place to make sure that we're managing the cost for those drugs so that the members that actually need the drugs for medical necessity are the ones receiving them and not those receiving those drugs simply for weight loss. So those prior authorization rules did go into place on June the 1st. So we should see a decrease in cost for those high cost diabetic meds. So that's also, in addition to the increased negotiated rebates, we'll see um, a de decrease in costs um, as those members fall off of the drugs, um, those taking those drugs for, um, for weight loss. So if we go to page six, which is your total plan costs. Total plan costs are up 7.7%. Um, still 1.8% below your five-year average, but again, through July, we're down that 5.5%, and through August, uh, with conservative projections, we do feel like the plan costs will be down to about two and a half. Uh, we are moving in the right direction, um, so we're doing good there. Can I ask a question? Sure. Uh, Ms. Benoit, I would like to ask a question. So uh, all of these charts, we, we have June, January to June for this mm -hmm. year. 
Is there any reason why we're not looking at January to June for all the other years? I mean, to me, that would be easier to be able to compare when you're saying right now we're at 893 as opposed to last year, which we're looking at the whole year. Right. Because you're not saying it was 829 for six months of last year. You're saying that was the whole year. Considered. No, we. that's why we show the figures on a per employee per month basis versus on a, a six month versus a whole year. That per, per employee per month number is an accurate comparison to the per employee per month in the prior year. So that percentage increase is an apple to an apple. You're absolutely correct. If you look at six months versus a whole year, the numbers look totally different. So right. putting it in that per employee per month figure actually gives you an accurate um, increase. Okay. Is this the well? Oh yeah, if you look at the per employee per month figures or apples to apples, yes. Yeah. The, the, the group analysis was not though, right? The, yeah, the, the bottom thing. the bottom line figure on page one, if you focus on the bottom um, the bottom portion, you'll see those per employee per month figures, and that's where we compare to get your seven point seven percent increase through June, the five point nine through July, down to the two and a half through August. Okay. Okay, if we flip back to page seven, which is your claims by type of service, um, as I mentioned before, your medical claims are up um, about 8%. Majority of that is coming from high cost claimants and increased inpatient utilization. We had a 73.1% increase in inpatient stays, $163 per employee per month versus the prior whole year um, at $94. So increased inpatient services, your outpatient services like outpatient surgery and um, outpatient physician services decreased by 6.8% and your physician services have remained stable, which is your doctor office visits at 324 versus the prior year at 326 per employee per month. And the majority of the increase from your inpatient services are coming for, from musculoskeletal, circulatory, you had some preemie newborn babies, um, and some nervous system claims. So we flip to page eight, which are your claims by diagnostic category. It'll, um, these are your top 10 diagnostic categories, number one being musculoskeletal diseases, which we see that often in our school system cases. Everyone's on their feet all day long, um, so they tend to suffer from musculoskeletal issues. That's very common. Um, number two, circulatory, and, and so on. But where we're seeing the increase from the prior year on a per employee per month basis are your musculoskeletal disease claims, circulatory claims are up 10.7%, nervous system. Um, we have a couple new breast cancer cases. Your breast cancer is up. And again, that number 10 is newborns. We did have a, um, a preemie baby. So you'll see an increase there. We go to page nine. These are your top 10 providers. Terrebonne General being number one, Thibodeau number two, and so on. Um, good thing this year you don't see MD Anderson in your top 10 as compared to the prior year. So that's good. Your cancer neoplasm claims are down. We don't see MD Anderson in your top 10, so that's good news. If we flip to page 10, this is your brand versus generic by number of scripts. Um, you guys are very compliant at 83% generic utilization. Um, you would wanna see a generic growth there from that 84.8% generic in prior year to 82.7% in the new year, but the reason you're seeing that decrease is because of that increased utilization in the brand name um, diabetic drugs. So you'll see it. You'll see a decrease there. So hopefully, we'll um, it, it'll it'll go up some once the decrease in utilization for those drugs go away. So even though generic is being filled for 83% of the time, if you flip to the next page. 83% drug utilization in generic is only costing the plan 8%. 
your brand name drugs are on, they only consist of 16% by count of drugs, but 90% of the total cost for your prescription drug plan. So you can see how expensive these brand name medications are and definitely fill generic when you can. It, it, it costs the plan a lot less. We're seeing increase, the increased cost is definitely coming from the diabetes as well as the increased uses of those high cost anti-inflammatories. The next page is gonna be your top 10 prescriptions by payment. You'll see right off the bat, number one is Ozempic. Um, that's one of those diabetic drugs. Um, di Ozempic's actually on this list twice in two different um, categories. Trulicity is also one of those particular drugs. Our top 10 drugs by payment increased 23% on a per employee per month basis. $161 for the first half of 23 as compared to $131 last year per employee per month. The top 10 prescriptions by payment represent 33% of the prescription claims of the prescription claim cost, but only 3% of the number of scripts. So you'll see that those drugs are costing the plan quite a bit of money. Your anti-inflammatories are up 10%. Your diabetes meds are up 44%. Um, majority of that coming from those uh, GLP-1 medications. And again, those, those drug rules did go into place on June 1st. Um, members would have received letters if they were affected by that. Um, but everyone who's needed those drugs for medical necessity have gotten them. Um, so no one's been without their medication. But if someone was truly taking that medication solely for weight loss, um, they won't be able to get that medication. What's that? Stellara is an anti-inflammatory, treats psoriasis, um, Crohn's disease, stuff like that. Okay, so this may sound like a rhetorical question, but to some degree it is, but is it plausible, is it something we can rationally say, the reason why we have such an increase in inpatient is because these medical facilities were working at a loss for the last couple of years mm -hmm. and they were like, hey, you know what? No one would bring some revenue in. Let's keep these patients overnight. Because mm -hmm. I've seen several cases where people were asked to stay for further evaluation, further observation, even overnight for things that normally wouldn't be the case. So I guess I already know the answer to the question, but what I'm wondering is what can we do to combat that? So HealthComp has case man. We, we, we pay for HealthComp to administer case management. Anytime you have a member in the hospital, a case manager is involved in that. And they do, they do require medical necessity to make sure that that patient is in there and is, is appropriate to stay in there for as long as they are. So the, the third party administrator handling the case management is policing that to make sure no one's in the hospital for longer than they need. I do understand your concern there. Um, well, it is subjective, and you did say folks said it was muscular and orthopedic, so that, that was the increase. So that's what I'm wondering is, is uh, you know, we have some open beds now. Let's keep them here overnight for observation type of thing. Mm -hmm. And um, I just want to make sure, you know, we're not being taken advantage of by these medical facilities because it's easy to become a target for them, you know, for mm -hmm. us operate with such a large number of you know, employees and such a large plan that a lot of things can maybe get overlooked from time to time. And, and if you think about it, these top two, Thibodeau and Terrebonne, I'm sure a lot of their board of trustees are friends with people that are in the school system or rather in the healthcare system in the, the region. So I'm just making sure we're not just taking advantage of it. So I'm glad to know that we have Right, and and also what I will mention to that is a lot of their a lot of these hospital contracts are up and negotiating their PPO fees because all of their costs have 
just like when you go to the grocery store, you pin, you spend in 10 times what you used to. The hospital is the same. So pretty much everybody has their hand out right now, need more money just to operate operate their daily business but the um, measures on the on the back side with the third party administrator are there to protect the plan to make sure there's no um no waste there uh, does any member of the audience have any questions um any members of the board other for the mr ford or uh, yeah um, come up Come up. Got to come up. Because you raised your hand. <laughs> okay. Go state your name and, and address. You know this is not right. <laughs> Janine Chauvin, I'm at Honduras Elementary. Um, so my diabetes medicine will be covered, and I will still be able to get that without any problems when I go. Because my biggest issue right now is I'm not getting my medicine. My Ozempic has been on back order due to possibly, um, so I am running, I'm hoping it will come in soon. As of right now, it's been two weeks, almost that, almost going on three, I don't have my medicine. So I'm trying, they, I've been checking, okay, well, it's still on back order, still on back order. So what do I do if I can't get that dosage? So 100% the reason why we have these prior authorizations in place because what we're seeing is the true diabetics who actually need the medication can't get the medication, yes. um, which is why the rule, rules are in there. So my suggestion to you, and you're not the first person that's, that's come to me with this, I mean, I'm sure you've checked all the pharmacies in town and, right. and whatnot. Um, we can contact the PBM script care who okay. handles the account and we can get them to help you locate your medication. Okay. Okay. Definitely we can help with that. But that's 100% why we have to have these rules in place so that yes. diabetics who truly need it to save their life can actually get yeah. the medication. And it's just trying to get them, okay, I check with Walmart, check with, no, it's still on backward, still on backward, still on backward. So just keep trying and just we can, and so just in the meantime, what do I do if we get to that point where I'm on that last dose? We'll help you find it. Yes. And, and she mentioned it was Mr. Curtis was here. Okay. I'll give you my card. Okay. And you, you might want to, uh, some pharmacies do have a harder time getting it than others. Okay. I, I have to go to particularly my, go to two different pharmacies. One for my norm, you know, my, my, the easy to get stuff and one right. for the uh, things like uh, for those Olympic okay. because uh, now I've, because I do that I've never had a problem but you may want to consider looking at other pharmacies okay. yeah. I can do that uh, just give me a chance. Uh, Mr. Ford did you have something you wanted to well, add? Well I just wanted to reiterate that she said the uh, requirements took effect June 1st so it's going to be a little bit of delay to catch up so uh, it will get better. So, but, okay. but rest assured, uh, Mr. Curtis and, and that whole department is looking out for us, uh, for you guys, because they did bring it to us back in April, I think it was. So it's been an ongoing process. All right. Okay. Um, thank you, Ms. Brune. I appreciate it. Uh, and uh, but before we go on, I did want to introduce a member of the Insurance Advisory Committee, Joan Moise. Uh, she works real hard with uh, Ms. Brunet and uh, Mr. Uh, um, um, uh, Fontaine and, and Curtis on, on the committee. So thank you, uh, Ms. Moise, for all you do for us. Uh, the next, oh, uh, yeah, item four is consideration approval of the group health and individual life insurance renewal. Uh, the committee recommends that the board approve and accept the renewal for companion life insurance through Alfred and Associates for group and individual life insurance effective August, uh, excuse me, October 1st, 2023 through September 30th, 2026 and further authorize the board president to sign all necessary documents pertaining thereto. Moved by Mr. Lagarde and seconded by myself, um, Mr. Constranza. 
We had, uh, this is an informational item at the board meeting uh, before, but before you, uh, I put this in front of you, just to, if you read it from left to right, the top left corner is what we have down. And it gives you the number of persons in that group, like we have 1997 full-time employees at the time of this. Then you have the rate, that's the number per thousand and the per thousands in the next corner. So it's 39 cents times 25. That gives you the individual rate and how much we're paying. So the next corner shows how much the insurance company wants to go up to. And then the final one shows what we're gonna actually have. And as you can see, for full-time employees, it will go up to $50,000 of life insurance. All the rates remain the same for the retirees. When someone retires, their insurance will, uh, life insurance will go down to 25, which is what we have done. And then at uh, 70, it drops down to 12.5, 87.50 at 75 plus. Um, and we'll have this all locked in for three years. Three years. Yes, ma'am, three years. Yep. Um, anybody from the audience wish to address this motion? Um, any members of the board? Mr. Voisin? No, these figures are what the school board is paying for each and every employee. The optional life, nothing changed there. Optional life is where someone buys extra for themselves. So for 1,997 people, we're gonna buy $50,000 of life insurance. The rest is gonna be 25. Then for, we have 373 members who are over 70 and so forth. Um, their rates didn't change, so they won't be a burden to them. But like I uh, said on the last time we met, basically what this does is it gives the life insurance company more money because they were losing money on our retirees, our older ones. They get more money on our active workers, but they're not really losing money on us. So though, if someone dies in active service, they're gonna need the extra protection anyway. They're not at retirement age, they probably still have uh, bills or, or, or debt they, they need to pay off because they're not there yet. So this helps them, helps the insurance company, helps our employees. Yeah. Uh, and just to clarify what he just said, it, it, they, they're getting a little, actives are getting, a, uh, we're paying a little more for the actives, but they're doubling the amount of coverage they're getting. So right, it's a, we're it balances out for just a few cents per thousand more. Ms. Benoit, I think you had a question. Yeah, and it's actually very similar to what Mr. Bozin just said. I guess I was not aware that the, the school system is paying for life insurance for everyone. Yes, all and active employees have a policy paid by, it's a term policy, so it's as good as long as you work. For how much is, how much is the life right, insurance? Right now it's 25. 25 on every and employee. And it's going to increase to 50. Wow. And so they pay nothing for it. We, we're paying. That. Right. They only pay if they want to get optional life. And every employee can get up to $300,000 of optional life. Okay. And then what about the retirees? Is they're getting they They can continue their optional life into retirement. And like I said, when they do retire, theirs will go down to 25,000. Uh, if they're 70 at the time of retirement, it'll go down to 12,500. Okay. But as long as they're at work, it'll be 50,000. I see. Okay, I was not aware that we were paying that. That's a big benefit. That and, and a lot of districts do that at different rates and Is different amounts. Is it really? Amounts. Other districts are paying life insurance? Yes. Been doing it for 40 years, wow. believe it or not. I just didn't realize that. <laughs> Um, I think you approved it your first term on the board. Uh, maybe I was asleep. <laughs> I, um, uh, I, I would also like to introduce uh, Katie Frohmeyer and Josh Alfred, two of the agents that uh, worked very hard on putting this package together for, uh, with uh, uh, Companion Life, along with their boss. Uh, uh, we appreciate all you, you've done for us. Thank you very, very much. Uh, the, um, the retired teachers are extremely happy um, that you know, their premiums uh, 
will not be going up on their optional that they pay for themselves. And I know I've gotten uh, comments from active uh, employees that are extremely grateful to the board for, uh, well, if you approve it in September, um, for the additional life insurance. So, um, any objection to the motion? Hearing, oh, go ahead. Well, you guys kind of glazed over it, so I just want to make sure the employees understand. We're not, this is really not an increase because we're getting double the coverage for exactly double the price. And I want every for employee. For the same to, price. For the same, I should say, rate. Price per, yeah, exactly. Per so thousand. the unit rate is the same. So that's what I want the employees to understand is, you know, you're getting 50000 this time instead of 25000 It's not coming out of your pocket. So it's coming out of our pocket as a board, as a district. So. Right. And not only that. Not only increasing the 50, but with the actives, there is double indemnity. So that's also included. So at 50, if it's an accident, it could be 100. I just wanted to put it in layman's terms because it kind of got confusing. Yes. Okay. Right. Hearing no objection to the motion, we uh, motion passes. Um, Item five, matter bearing upon Hurricane Ida FEMA updates. Adam LaFort, grant specialist with All South Consulting Engineers. Hello again. Um, so y'all should have a packet on y'all uh, table or desk, and we'll have Becky start, and I'll kind of take over after. Yes. Everybody find it. The autograph. Okay, um, you have two graphs here. The first one will kind of feed into the second one, so I'll go over the first one uh, first. This is Hurricane Ida. Total expenses since the hurricane, August 29th, 2021, through June 30th, 2023. So this is everything that we have spent on hurricane response and recovery up from the day of the hurricane through June 30th. Okay, and we have it broken down kind of into different little um, sections or slices of, of this pie chart. The largest section that you'll see here in the dark blue is um, made up of several different items all into one category of repairs. So it's temporary repairs, it's uh, remediation, it was the you know water removal right after the hurricane, it was temporary roofing, debris removal, uh, roof repairs, and permanent building repairs, kind of all rolled up into one um, big piece here. And you can see the total there is about $56.8 million that we've spent so far on those activities. Uh, the next largest is the dark purple, which is content replacement. So this is all the contents of all the schools um, and all of our office buildings that had damage. And the, the way that we were taught to think of contents is if you could pick up the building and turn it over and shake it, everything that would fall out is considered contents. So this is the replacement of, of those things. We're just about finished replacing all of that. We have a little bit more to go um, on the schools that you know some of the schools that we're having to rebuild and we have some few other things that we we are uh, still replacing as we work through repairs but we're nearly um, finished with contents replacement uh, the next little thin slice that you see there a bright pink is our labor for Terrebonne Parish School Board employees where we had overtime or extra time that we paid to our custodians our maintenance staff our warehouse staff um, who needed to work extra either right after the hurricane or even since while we have um, construction going on in some of the schools they're having to go open up and lock up on the weekends and things like that so that the cost of, of our employees um, working is in the little pink slice and the last piece um, is a services category 
The services category is made up of several um, different items, and I have broken that on the second uh, chart for you, so we'll get to that in just a minute. But so total expenditures from the hurricane till now is about $79.2 million. And if you remember when we first, right after the hurricane, you know, we started getting some estimates from our insurance company and from others and thinking it might be about 200 million. Um, there's a good chance that that is, will turn out to be an accurate number by the time we finish everything that we need to finish. Um, so this is what we've spent so far and um, lots left to come, but we've, we've, we've done a lot and we have a lot going on right now. Um, okay, back to the yellow piece, that the services slice. If you turn the page, this next graph is everything that makes up that yellow piece in the first graph. Um, and so if we can start with the largest section there, it is um, architect fees. You know, we have you know, several architects working for us. They were here right after the storm doing damage assessments and damage estimates for us right up through now as we are doing our permanent work. Um, if you go kind of clockwise from there, the bright orange slice is engineering fees. Um, the next gray slice is project managers, what we've paid our project managers so far. The yellow is what we've paid our environmental consultant for, you know, mold remediation, water remediation, um, asbestos, and that kind of thing. Um, the next kind of dark blue is um, the FEMA consultant. That's all south. That's Adam. Um, the next is installation and support fees. That is um, every time we have to take down and put up a Promethean board from classrooms or move them from one school to another, we have to pay the company to do it so that we don't want void the warranty. So this is what we are paying them to move um, these boards for us. Um, and then the last is a survey service, which is um, we needed floodplain certificates on all of our schools. So that was um, to get those floodplain certificates. So this um, is the total services. It's about $9.6 million in services, which again is the kind of the yellow slice in the other pie, if that makes sense. Um, does anybody have any questions about this? It's very helpful. Okay. Is this what, I know that you had specifically asked for something like this. Is yeah. this what you had in mind? Yeah. It's okay. Very helpful. Great. Okay, good. Okay, so all of these are reimbursed by FEMA at 90%, except for the FEMA consultant is reimbursed at 100%. Okay, and then the third uh, page is where we are to date on what we've submitted and what FEMA has approved. Um, so, so far obligated, um, this includes work that has been completed and also work to be completed. So we have about $111 million obligated to date. Um, and as of now, we have about $38 million that has been already refunded back to the district. Most of this comes from the temporary work, um, which was mentioned earlier, um, and that is all mostly paid at 100%. However, when, the, when we do our request for uh, reimbursement, FEMA only, our GOSEP only pays 80% upfront, and they pay the remaining 20% at closeout. So that's why when we see the amount received by TPSD, it doesn't always match the obligated amount. Are, of the 90 are the 100 percent so if you look in the description uh, it kind of tells you which projects are 90 percent and which ones are 100 percent okay. so um most of all of our cat b work which is our temporary work that was done immediately after the storm has been reimbursed to date um and i mean the only other ones we're starting to push forward is um with the elementary schools and the temporary campuses are the ones that we kind of have remaining that we are still having ongoing expenses for. We're not done expending those. So I'm open to any questions if anyone has any. Good job. Okay, so 
in the spirit of transparency, can we make this information available to the public in the same format with a brief description? Yes. Because I think it's very important for them to know, to see that, well, one, they complain a lot about FEMA, and, and we do too, you know, in jest, but it takes a long time for the process, but without them, all of this would be our responsibility, this, this full amount. So I think it's important for the public to know that because sometimes their expectations can be a little skewed, in my opinion, and this would help kind of give them some of that satisfaction because seeing this helps us, but it would help them a lot more. So if you can make that available, that would be great. Thank you. I guess in looking at these figures, I think um, everything is explanatory. I, I guess my question would be that is everything pretty much what we wanted to be supposed in lines as far as the money and everything? I mean, the proportion of the pie and et cetera. Um, yes, I, I think that it is. We knew that our permanent repairs and the actual construction was going to cost the most and and it is you can see the big piece of the the first um, pie is is the actual construction so um yeah I, I think that it's exactly what we would have expected okay thank you mr mr hamlin <laughs> you can go all right thank you sir <laughs> so so just looking at these numbers it, it's I feel encouraged that, that the, the money is, is being reimbursed timely, um, especially when we get to the point of, of instructing schools, knowing that it's going to come in fairly quickly. Once it's obligated, um, we'll have that cash flow to kind of take care of covering some of the bills we're going to pay when we start uh, building potentially three schools at one time. So we'll um, need this to be continually reimbursed as it is. So thank you for all South for what you've uh, done. Project sure. management, thank you for your, your contributions and getting this stuff rolling. Architects as well, appreciate you. And Mr. Fort, thank you for uh, the, the report and Becky, you too, appreciate it. Uh, moving on, uh, matter bearing upon the monthly budget to actual comparison report and the monthly sales tax collections update, Ms. Michelle Klingman, Supervisor of Finance. Good evening. Your uh, monthly budget to actual comparisons are in your packet, um, and I'll be happy to entertain any questions. But moving on to the sales tax, it's a decrease of 3.17% for the month of June in comparison to last June. Any questions for Ms. Klingman? That's good. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Klingman. Thank you. Um, Motion to adjourn. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Lagarde. Turn the meeting back over to the next person. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Hamner. The executive committee's call to order. Present this evening is myself, Mr. Voisin, Vice President, and Mr. Lagarde, member. Also present are Mr. Harding, uh, Mr. Ford, Ms. Benoit, Mr. Hamner, Mr. Ogeron, and members of his staff. Uh, a, a, an examination of invoices of the current month, including supplemental payroll and travel expenses have been completed. Are we have, do we have any committee member concerns? Mr. Wazan? Mr. Uh, any other board members? Do I have a motion to accept invoices? Motion by Mr. Wazan, second by Mr. Lagarde. Uh, any public comment? Mr. Wazan? Mr. Lagarde? No, any other board members? Any objections? None heard, so moved. Motion, motion to adjourn. By Mr. Boise, seconded by Mr. Uh, Lagarde. Any public comment? 
Uh, comments, gentlemen? Any other board members? None to heard. No objections heard, so ordered. We have one remaining committee. Vice, uh, Vice Chair Mr. Harding and member Dr. Traha, along with Mr. Lagarde, Mr. Ford, Mr. Be uh, Ms. Benoit, and Mr. Hamner, Mr. Um, Ogeron, superintendent, members of his staff are present. Consideration of approval of authorization to advertise for six month bids for meats, frozen items, and canned and dry goods for the 2024 spring session. The committee recommends that the board approve and authorize the child nutrition department to advertise for six month bids for meats and frozen items and canned and dry goods for the 24, 2024 spring session, January 1st, 2024 through June 30, 2024. Funds to be derived from the child nutrition program fund. So move Mr. Harding, second, second. Dr. Traham. Any public comments? Mr. Harding, Dr. Traham, no. other board members? Any objections? Hearing none, motion passes. Consideration of approval of bid received for the building repair project at Lisa Park and Oakshire Elementary Schools. The committee recommends that the board approve and accept the lowest bid received meeting all specifications for the building repair project in response to Hurricane Ida at Lisa Park Elementary and Oakshire Elementary Schools from Freetown Builders, LLC, 313 Garden Street, Lafayette, Louisiana, 70501, in the amount of $954,000, and establish a total project budget in the amount of $1,057,798, funds to be derived from FEMA reimbursement funds, $952,018.20, and local funds, $105,779.80, and further authorize the board president to sign all necessary documents pertaining thereto. So I move Mr. Harding. Second. Second, Dr. Traha. Any public comments? Mr. DePlanis. No, no. Mr. Wagenspeck? Wagenspeck, yes. Sorry sir. about that, sir. No, that's quite all right. Yes, please enlighten us on all of this. Uh, uh, 
just um, Any... we had a good turnout. Uh, I think there was four uh, contractors that bid on it. Um, okay. Any, any, questions? Well. any questions, Mr. Hardy? Yes. Dr. Trahan, any other board members? Yes, Mr. Ford? Just if you could briefly give an explanation of what type of repairs we're looking at for people. Sure. Um, generally, uh, there's a little bit of roof repair to one of the buildings. Um, they have a couple of um, storage buildings outside that are getting repaired, whether it's the roof or the vinyl siding kind of stuff. Uh, but a lot of it is interior repairs, uh, mechanical, electrical work. Awesome. Thank you, Mr. Ford. Any other board members? Thank you, Mr. Wackett. Back. Um, any objections? Hearing none. Motion passes. <clears throat> Consideration of approval of substantial completion of the abatement project at Acadian Elementary. The committee recommends that the board approve and accept the substantial completion dated July 9, 2023, for the abatement project at Acadian Elementary School, subject to the punch list. Upon a completion of the punch list and final inspection and receipt of the lien-free certificate, authorize the release of retainage, and further authorize the board president to sign all necessary documents pertaining thereto. So moved, so moved Dr. Traha, second Mr. Harding. And, um, here we have Ms. Not Justin Viviano, but I was about Andrea to say, Masso. I didn't think so. Okay. <laughs> um, would you like to elaborate on any of this um, information? I'm not that familiar with the project. Okay. I do know the contractor is off site, completed with his work. And okay, fantastic. We appreciate that. Any other public comments? Any questions, Ms. Dr. Tron, Mr. Harding? Any other board members? Thank you very much, ma'am. Sure. Any objections? Hearing none, motion passes. Now we're gonna move into informational by our um, project managers and architects. So Mr. Ryan Smith, project manager, Volkert. Good evening. Um, I think uh, what I'd like to do is kind of do an overall, I mean, we have uh, some of the details down in here as well, but we do the overall one. We added a um, the completed projects, the projects under construction, and uh, that goes along with the, uh, the schedule uh, information that's on the 11 by 17. Um, so currently we have uh, four projects that, that are completed. Mainly, those are you know the modular buildings uh, to get kids back uh, into school that were more most immediate. Um, we have seven projects under construction right now, and uh, seven more projects that uh, have all had bid openings. Uh, well, Terrebonne High, the bid opening is going to be uh, Thursday, but um, basically for everything else. So we've had pre-construction meetings, bids have all been approved. Uh, basically the ones that say projects out for bid awaiting construction to start. I mean, those are gonna be, next time we meet, those are gonna be slid over into the projects under construction. Um, so that'll be sort of the majority of that one. Um, essentially everything will be shifting to the left here. Uh, Homer Junior High is out in bid and uh, Legion Fields in Honduras uh, have that paperwork ready to go and uh, gonna get that out to bid here uh, shortly. Um, and then the other ones are just, uh, you know, as, as we're, we're waiting on some FEMA determinations, um, you know, we'll be ready to go uh, as soon as those come up. Um, and then the next sheet just kind of shows uh, all of that in uh, essentially just a different, different format uh, of that if you want more of the, the kind of details, uh, dates and stuff. And then we have our visual uh, calendar um, again that the colors sort of match you know on uh, the first and the last page um, the other thing I just wanted to kind of point out uh, in the uh, committee update um, that we have listed here I mean obviously each school is listed and uh, you know has a little uh, status of what's going on at each school so if you get any calls or need any talking points, then uh, that's that's all here. Uh, not too, too much has changed as we're mostly in the construction phase of most of these. Um, and so 
a lot of it, uh, again, is just coordinating and um, with the, the principal um, on some projects, it's the, the ESSER representatives, the administration, and the uh, contractor that's performing the work. Uh, there's been a tremendous amount of coordination uh, with that. And so that's why if we flip all the way to the, the very back, one of the things I wanted to, to add on here, and we have these for really all schools, but I, I think this one lays it out the best, is the um, phasing plan for Acadian. And um, so when you read the Acadian that says phase one, the corridor four, administrative hall, cafeteria, portable seven and eight, this kind of gives you more of a visual. Phase two, uh, you know, we're wrapping up phase two, gonna go into phase three. Um, but really I wanted to show, uh, you know, this was not done in a vacuum, that the, the principals uh, took a lot of their time and were very um, considerate and thoughtful on uh, what rooms we could block out uh, you know, how much they could shut down at any given time to get these repairs done. Uh, meanwhile, considering, um, you know, the, the safety standards uh, as well. So we need, you know, two modes of egress. We always need to, to have two ways, you know, out of a building uh, in case of an emergency. Um, the phase one that, that's kind of shown in green here, all of that is the administrative um, corridor and the cafeterium. So that way we could use that cafeteria as a swing space and then have that corridor operational so that we have, you know, we, we can check kids in, you can, um, you know, you have the intercom available, you have internet available. So all of that was really critical to get that done during the summer. Um, and they, they, they completed it and, and then some, then they started on, on phase two as well. Um, and then phase three will be that, that other side uh, of the building and so then that'll complete really that, that whole building. Um, and then we'll move on to, to the other buildings. Um, and so that's, that's really what I just kind of wanted to present. If you have any questions about specific uh, schools, I can certainly answer them. And I know that you have architects that, that have some, um, some other information for you. Um, so I'm open to any. So, so just looking at Acadian, like you, you, you just went through, phase one is complete. Yes. Okay, so then we're going to move to phase two, so that whole area is going to be shut down. Correct. That's what you're saying. So it is currently shut down uh, in, in a very safe way where they have uh, Bisqueen up, really double taped. Uh, they have they've did a tremendous effort on making sure that uh, all the airflow is contained inside of there, so nothing uh, is getting out and going into the rest of the school. Um, and so, so yes, I mean, I, I just want to just really show the detail, the level of detail of you know, when we say contained, I mean, it is really contained that no one can access it except for the contractor, so the students are safe, uh, you know, because safety was the, the paramount thing. And so really, uh, again, between the contractor, the principal, uh, the, the staff here, I mean, it was really amazing for everyone to, to come in, really visualize what needs to happen and right. get it done appropriately. Right, well, that, yeah, that looks good to see that. And every school is being done similar to that. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Dr. Trahan? A uh, question about Upper Lokayu. It says uh, project on hold. We approved those uh, motions for demolition and uh, and uh, what was the other one for? Reconstruction. Reconstruction. So that's actually not on hold right now, right? Yeah, I mean, we have to like, get, bring that up to date yes. as well. Yeah, please update that because that kind of struck me a little bit. Noah said, not on hold anymore. We finally got FEMA re uh, decision yeah. on up low in Grand Cay Elementary. Right. Thank you, Dr. Trahan. Mr. Ford? What about what's, uh, what's the holdup with that? Ah, good question. <clears throat> I don't quite know too, too much. I know that's going through. Um, so, 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 a few things we're waiting on a ruling from the PRO, correct? That, so, that's, that's, that's the one they could take. So it's litigation. Okay. Just wanted to make sure. All right, thank you. Okay. Any other board members? Any other questions for? Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah, Legion. So um, for the the Esser stuff. Uh, you know, they've gotten a lot of the, the hallways and everything all redone there. Uh, they're waiting on the cassettes uh, that for the air conditioning that'll blow into each room. 
Uh, what the interior contractor has done has built up to those cassettes of the existing, uh, placed lights in it, and so the ceilings are all done. Uh, they have both sides of the hallway on floor one done, and now they're up on the second floor uh, doing, doing that as well. Uh, and I believe that the all, uh, walls have all been closed in and uh, yeah so just awaiting the windows uh, to get those put in as soon as they they come in um, yeah the library portion is done so then we're gonna wait on doing the oh uh, we're gonna wait on doing the floors because basically we're dropping in all the ceilings uh, so the kids can utilize uh, that space uh, again it was phased I think very very well uh, with Miss McGuire and uh, you know really working through all that the other part that I wanted to mention for uh, both the Caden and Legion Park is that we had a separate contract for the roof and that has been complete. Uh, we're going to meet tomorrow to, to finalize that so the next meeting will have a substantial completion uh, <coughs> agenda. That is soon to happen. We are, uh, that's, that's next week. We have the pre-construction meeting on all that. Um, since we had some asbestos discovery that we needed to get that, and that's gonna be taken care of this weekend. Um, and then we're gonna move forward on that, uh, especially for uh, the Acadian modular, because once that comes down, um, uh, Dan and Bruce will uh, you know, have the next one ready to go and, and install right on top of that. Mr. Hamner. Yeah. Yeah. Speak. <clears throat> Speaking of Legion, you know, that school holds a special place in my heart, uh, and I can't wait to go see it. But you know, I, I really want Superintendent Orgeron to acknowledge uh, she's not here, but Mrs. McGuire for managing through all this, all those, well, those, those children. She's done a tremendous job keeping the, the, the show running over there and, and uh, you know, in the midst of, uh, a lot of work. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, yes, yes, sir. Um, and, and I think the the pace was, or, or I guess I should say, getting it ready for schools opening was was remarkable. And, and and Sherry was monitoring it all summer long. She'd call probably Ryan. She'd call us here. When I say all summer long, like every day, she was checking in, and she wasn't on the clock. So she was making sure that uh, workers were there doing what they needed to do and, and managing all that, reporting back, I'm sure, right, Ryan? Yes, very much. Um, and her and Ms. Cook both moving classes around like they're doing right now to kind of work on spaces. And it, that takes a ton of coordination and patience and, and leadership to keep everybody calm and, and, and controlled. Because if they get frantic, everyone feeds off of that right. energy. And they've done a great job just holding it down, making sure everybody's flowing, <coughs> comforting everybody, encouraging everybody throughout that whole time. And you've seen I, it firsthand, right? I couldn't right, agree right? more. I mean, change is always uh, difficult for yes, kids, and yes. they've, they've done and extremely well. they've done a well tremendous that. job, both yeah. of those principals in particular. And I also just wanted to point out real quick, I mean, all, all the principals have been fantastic. But I would say Ms. McGuire and Ms. Cook over at, at Acadian have just the uh, same thing. It's just been really active. Those are sort of you know, they're so major, right? There's so much going on there that, um, you know, that, that it does take a tremendous amount of leadership. Yeah, and, and, and we said Mrs. McGuire, but she represents the faculty, the staff, the uh, custodians, the, you know, that she is the school and uh, mm -hmm. yeah. she's done it. Yeah, I just, just wanted to make that known. Thank you, Mr. I'm sorry, go ahead. But we, there, there's just, there's so many uh, kudos to, to throw out there I mean we, we have yeah. we have Sammy and John who and when I think about Legion when you looked at Legion the week before like I said earlier we I, I was thinking of a plan B you know like what, what's our plan B and somebody said well, what is your plan B is it, we, we, we could platoon we could we could start school later we could delay start so so really plan B was not even really something seriously considered but we were thinking about it but to get it ready from what they did with custodial support uh, getting there and cleaning it, it, it was a, amazing. Getting air flowing, getting it cool, uh, a lot of people put in to kind of get kids ready. And it's, it's not in a great shape, it really isn't, we know that, but it's gonna be beautiful. It really will be great. Good, thank you. Teamwork, lots of teamwork. Okay. Yes, Mr. Uh, 
Harding. Thank you. Uh, actually, I received some phone calls in reference to Allegiant Park School, and uh, I kind of went out on a limb to say that it was going to be done. So I'm glad it was taken care of. I didn't even get my words. <laughs> but actually, but, but on the serious side, they actually have done a great job. I really, I really didn't think it was going to be ready, but I just told people it was going to be ready. Kind of calmed down a little bit. So I didn't have to eat crow, but I was going. Of course, I was going to blame it on Mr. Olger. You know what I'm saying? So. <laughs> I think they sent extra staff over there to kind of yes. uh, help out with that, move some janitors around to help out with the uh, opening the, of the school and stuff. So the guys, actually everybody doing a good job. Yes, sir. Thank you. Any other board members? Anything else, Mr. Ryan? Nope. Good. Thank you very Thank much, you. sir. Appreciate it. Uh, next, the um, Hammerman and Gaynor. Well, I didn't see him back there. <laughs> yes, Mr. Curtis. Mr. Curtis. Good evening to you, board members. I'm going to carry on the uh, same torch that Ryan with Volker spoke about because we do know we have some additional details tonight. Um, we are reporting 68% of our schools that are under construction um, in various phases, and those schools are made up of um, Bayou Black, Broadmoor Elementary, Du Large, uh, HL Bourgeois High School, South Terrebonne High School, and uh, wrapping up uh, the punch list of Grand Caillou Middle. And to hear what you guys just discussed in the last three, four minutes, it also has been a lot of coordination, but it's been a pleasure to work with the principals and the leaderships on the individual levels for the schools and the sites assigned to us as well because it does take a team effort. Um, with our facilities that are under construction, they're all in various phases of construction that consist from, you know, we've closed in the roof uh, and have those areas completely dried in at South Terrible High School to where we've been doing masonry work. Uh, we've been doing duct cleaning. Yeah. Yes, this is just the gym at South Terrible High School. So thank you for that, Superintendent. Um, we've been doing HVAC duct cleaning and, and getting those uh, systems ready and in place for the start of school this past uh, last Monday. Um, interior flooring work, ceiling tile insulation. So all of the various things that you guys have already heard, I will briefly touch on you know, some of those real quickly. And what you have before you is our document reporting from kind of a July to early August because this stuff is very fluid and it changes on a daily and a weekly basis. Um, but the second page is probably a new page that we've inserted for this month, which gives uh, some data on the estimated construction completion. And as we go out and check construction on a weekly basis um, for quality and for scope, we also update our reports with the small task force that we meet uh, made up of the school board um, each Thursday as well as with the schedules that the contractors provide us for our updates as well to you all on a monthly basis and based off of that information we've tried to give you guys um, the window of the month and the year of when some of these sites in your respective districts will will come to uh, substantial completion so that is what uh, the second page is, is, is uh, showing there. And if you guys have any questions as you review that, then I'll uh, welcome those questions and, and try to answer those. And then our very last page gives you um, a few more details on the specific notes. If you're getting any calls or just wondering about schools in your communities and drills down more specifically on those schools of the percentage of completion based off of those pay apps that we've been um, approving for process. I do, like, <clears throat> I do like that you all created that second page to kind of mirror some of the other things. It, it does help us see that. Yep. So um, I'm going to go through that real quickly yeah. by school, and then I'll let you guys know as well for the ones that are pending. Um, and then I'll open up for questions. So Bayou Black is uh, under construction, and 
estimated completion is there for November of this year. Um, within that facility, we've done flooring, HVAC work, electrical, and paint, and we're still working on uh, some other things associated with the cafeteria, but we've gotten everything submitted and approved, and we're moving forward with that process. Broadmoor, uh, that is one that we're both coordinating with the EFSA project manager, uh, with the grants manager, and also with the hurricane work. So we're working in conjunction, and not only that school, but the other schools we have assigned to us. There's at least a bi-weekly coordination to make sure that we're covering our bases between both projects. So just Broadmoor, so you're saying completion, construction completion, like next month? Yes. Okay, so that school's gonna be completely done? Is that what we're saying? With, with our hurricane work is what I'm reporting. Reporting. Okay. On. Yes, sir. Because I'm still seeing some some plywood up there. <laughs> yeah. Yep. So. And, and we're working actively right now in the rear um, okay. with materials that we have coming in to finish up some of the exterior work and the. Okay. Well, canopy. you still have another month. Yeah, another month. Okay. All right. <laughs> okay. Just, just that's good. That's good. I'm glad to hear that. Thank you. Um, Moving on to uh, Do Large, um, we started over there at that school, and we have siding and flooring um, taking place at Do Large. Uh, we've done some um, acoustical ceiling tile and some VCT work. Uh, the other schools, um, they are kind of self-explanatory. We are working through with the Fletcher facility on the mechanical, and we just had. Uh, some updates on that this week. So there'll be some things that the architects will speak to and I'll, I'll let them give those details a little bit further on in the agenda. And um, really and truly the rest of the list is kind of self-explanatory, but what I wanted to focus on is we actually have a start date for the administrative, the IT annex building and transportation and maintenance. And that is scheduled to commence at the end of this month around the 28th. So you guys will start to see some work taking place, you know, here at these facilities as well. And um, earlier today, we actually had both Montague Elementary and Middle uh, Construction kickoff meeting. So we'll be working on those schools as well. Now that our contract documents are signed, we're just waiting to get those recorded, and then we'll be moving forward as well. So for next month, we'll have. And we're looking forward to that plywood coming off that front door, too. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you said yes, that. Because I was thinking. So next month, we'll have another five or six facilities to add and update to our report. Any, you have anything else? Mr. Uh, Lagarde. Any other board members? Mr. Ford. Make it brief. <laughs> okay, good. Mr. Orgeron, anything? Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Curtis. Okay, okay Mr. Steve Rome with the um, Burgess Rome Architects. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, Steve Rome and uh, Rick Fenner uh, reporting on our projects for Virgis Rome Architects. Um, uh, for the projects that we have, Homewood Junior High School, the roofing is uh, is complete. The contractor has a few punch list items to complete and, and uh, finish up with the uh, uh, recording the uh, the project to, to end it. So, very excited there. We haven't heard any complaints uh, uh, from the uh, from the school on that. Um, the uh, Junior High. Uh, interiors project which was broken out into separate one will be bidding uh, on the 22nd uh, this month uh, for getting uh, getting that going we have some uh, exciting to see people involved uh, uh, contractors involved and also uh, contractors like you talked about here before uh, willing to uh, wanting to plan some of their work in the evenings nights or, or weekends to get it work in a, with a fully occupied building and working with with the like staff that. to make that happen. Yeah, like that. Yeah. yeah. So, we hope that works out. Just like the uh, um, the the road workers, uh, the night shift, right? Oh yeah, so hot. Okay. Um, 
the uh, uh, Terrebonne High School uh, will be um, uh, bid Thursday. Uh, we had a couple delays in the bid, bidding for that, but on Thursday there, we're looking for a good turnout uh, for that. They had a lot of ac activity, uh, a lot of questions answered. And Andrew Price was bid uh, last week. Uh, it should be starting up uh, uh, very soon, too. So uh, th those will be uh, working out uh, real well, I think. All three of those projects uh, have uh, dates that if we start in October, if the, the, uh, the, uh, there will be a lot, of, all the work will be done during the school year. Uh, there'll be some questions probably asked at that time. And, uh, I'm sure the other uh, designers are having the same uh, questions come up about work during the school year in uh, occupied buildings. So uh, we hope that all works out fine. Um, uh, the other uh, uh, work is for Fletcher. And uh, I think we've got things worked out for the chiller replacements on that, some wording. We're waiting on the final wording for it to put that out for bids uh, next week. Okay. Yeah, the chiller, the two chillers are intended to handle the entire building, except for one, uh, uh, one small area in the back where we had that air conditioner that's missing. But yes, yes, that's a, um, the um, facilities, HGI, uh, all south have all been working over time to uh, get something working to, for the uh, FEMA participation with that with that work. Okay. It is a difficult because it's a it's a uh, um, uh, a building that's not occupied, yeah. so that'll, uh, there's a lot of questions with that. Any questions, Mr. Liber uh, Harding? Dr. Trump. Okay, Ms. Benoit. So okay. ha have plans been drawn up for Terrebonne High? Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, yes. When it's will we be able to see what's been done? Uh, okay. The inside and the outside. Well, I know the right. I know the it's being pressure washed, but what what changes are going to be done is what I would like to see. Yeah, I was reporting just on the Hurricane Ida repair. So oh, I see. Interesting okay, stuff. I'm sorry. Steve yeah. yeah, right, I am. I'm talking. Yeah. I'm Steve Rome, principal of Burgess Rome Architects. Um, this summer, we took advantage of the school being out to work with the administration and faculty in each of the departments to kind of hear the uh, pros and cons of what they're experiencing with the building, uh, what the deficiencies are. At the same time, taking a look at codes, you know, what upgrades would be, as well as addressing security. Um, we've met with um, <coughs> Superintendent Ogeron and um, Chief Financial Officer Becky, along with Principal Richard Starr, on many occasions as we progress and we begin to you know, accumulate information to formulate a program in a direction. Um, Terrebonne is a big tiger. It's over 250,000 square feet. Um, all of the existing drawings that we had were copies of copies of copies, so we took the initiative to scan every facility on that campus, including the stadium, uh, because there are uses that are taking place underneath it, as well as we call the new gym, the old gym, the whole building, and the whole exterior. So we've taken all of those three-dimensional scans and put it into the Revit model, which give us accurate you know, existing conditions, and any time instead of running out to the field and taking photographs, we can pull up the model, go to that room, and address everything that's going in each of those spaces. So that's, you know, took a little time, but uh, I think the planning is going very well. Um, we, you know, we took it, like I said, we took advantage of the summertime to get as much of that information, and we're now beginning to see how this plan could be repurposed and all put together for the future. Yeah, sure. I so, if you may want to elaborate a little bit, the, the, the new thing about what, what they're doing at Terrell High is they're going to address academics with the lab space, they're going to address classroom space, maximizing everything kind of fits over here. They're looking at athletics and helping those things, the art department, the home ec department, uh, student congregation areas, and, and the floor of the classroom. From the morning sunrise to sunset, uh, what takes place every square inch is important. Um, you would 
efficient on toilets. So we're making that work into the plan to make it easier. We're really looking at security from drop off to pick up. Um, it's different all during the day to see what we can do to control the patterns for ultimate safety. Um, we're very excited on how we're doing some repurposing. The underutilized spaces now will be put back into what we call commerce once again for better uses and actually better function um, for, for Terrebonne High School. Now that we've got um, ninth grade moving in, we're working very closely with Principal Richard Starr, looking how the schedules are doing, how can we maybe make sure that we continue to maintain a surplus of classrooms in the future. So it's pretty much getting close to a solution in that regard. Well, I've seen the, the, the remodels that you've done to the historic schools in New Orleans that have just been transformed beautifully. And so that's why I was anxious to see what the plans were for, for Terrebonne. We will protect that building. Um, every aspect of it is just ingenious in terms of how it was put together. I'm sure most of you know that it was a 1938 uh, WPA building, the same architecture firm who did the courthouse, did Terrebonne High, and of course, Homer Junior High, and um, uh, the trade school, uh, which is now Fletcher. Um, the details are great. You know, what we need to do, I hate to say this, but I think the actual addressing of the restoration of the building is the easy part. <laughs> what we need to do is really get the function and the operations current 21st century forward. I mean, it's everything has to be looked at. We're looking at every square inch. All of it's valuable. And some good solutions are starting to be developed. Awesome. We'll be very close. We have a meeting yeah. next week, kind of look at the next set of thinking. Um, we are meeting with regulatory agencies, the State Fire Marshal, and, you know, South Central, um, the IBC, uh, making sure that we feel that some of the uh, code requirements are a little excessive you know it's kind of normal we'll go there and see what we could do either get exceptions or appeals if we need to um, um, don't always want to depend on the grandfather clause but there's a lot of areas that we can do that but we also have ideas that's going to enhance these departments that we want to just make sure that it's all cleared up before we finalize any um, you know presentation formal presentation but we are looking forward to that day we're very proud of how things are developing okay. Good. thank you any other board members thank you very much thank I'd you. like to also thank the gentleman for the report on the um, Ida construction mr. Ogeron I don't know if this is premature but do we have a plan for Fletcher yet you know once it's completed we kind of it's coming. it's coming okay all right very good thank you yes okay. all right thank you yeah. <laughs> okay, so number eight, uh, Mr. Depository, pos Positary, excuse me, Mr. Depository. <laughs> Whoops, it's been a long night. Sorry about that. <laughs> I, I will say it's not the first time I've heard. It. <laughs> I am so sorry. I read. <laughs> I'm gonna make it quick then. I need some new glasses. <laughs> All right. Good evening, everyone. Um, oh, <laughs> I, know, I had a drill sergeant call me that for an entire summer, so it's, it's not the first time I've heard it. Um, all right. So an update on the Hurricane Ida uh, repair work that we have. Um, first, I'll start with Bayou Black. Curtis mentioned earlier that uh, at the last pay application, they were about 60% uh, 60 complete. That's probably now closer to about 80 or 85 percent complete. They were finishing up some brickwork in the last few days on the front of the classroom and cafeteria building. Um, and so aside from that, most of the interior repairs are done. There's a little bit of electrical work that's left. Fencing on the outside's been done. Uh, and so I think that although the contract time runs through November, I'm, I'm fairly confident in saying that we'll probably come to you before that. Uh, with a request for a substantial completion. So I think in the next several weeks, we're going to be looking at a, uh, a substantial completion inspection. We'll generate a small uh, punch list. <clears throat> and so I think that will finish uh, ahead of schedule. Thank you. Very fantastic. The uh, next project is HL Bourgeois. Um, <clears throat> at, at, at this site right now, they have completed the installation of the 
uh, the hydronic piping, they've cleaned the duct work, and they are in the process of um, reinstalling ceiling tiles. They started in the back athletic areas. They're now working their way into that kind of that center area where the classroom core is. They're in corridors, uh, little small corridors in those spaces right now, and they're coordinating with the principal to turn over uh, little pods of classrooms at a time. So they're, they're replacing ceiling tile and floor tile there. Um, they have also, or um, I should say they're in the process of receiving some roofing material um, starting this week, I believe. So as they receive that material, they'll start to work on the roof replacement uh, as well. So it's progressing well over there. I know they're in close contact with the principal there to be able to, to get spaces to work in and move furniture. It's a little bit of a, uh, a leapfrog exercise, but they're, they're doing, a, they're, they're managing it well. Uh, the other bid package that we had, and this is a combination, Montague Elementary School and Montague Middle School. Uh, Curtis reported on that a little, a little while ago. We had our pre-construction conference today. Um, we requested to Dr. Trahan's earlier point that when they mobilize on site, which we think will be on or around August 28th, about two weeks from now, that they bring two pieces of glass with them to, to repair the two. Uh, broken glasses on two doors. So, uh, the principal uh, of both schools were at our pre-construction conference this morning. So there's been coordination that started there. They met the uh, contractor superintendent. So I know they'll be in close contact there. And then our last project uh, to report on is Mulberry Elementary School. <clears throat> that one also had a pre-construction conference this afternoon. Uh, the principal from that school was there as well. And so again, it's a lot of. Um, a lot of coordination. So again, we, we anticipate the contractor uh, notice to proceed somewhere around August 28th, the end of the month. Um, both of those, both the Montague schools and Mulberry have a seven month duration. So we're looking at probably April of 2024, you know, give or take what happens with weather um, as, as completion. So yeah, that's the goal. By the time the next school year starts, we'll, everybody will be out of those. The contractors will be out. Good. Questions? Dr. I'm happy. Good. Any board members? Mr. Um, Ogeron? Uh, let's see. Um, it's not on the sheet that I got today, but I know that they were. Um, l let me follow up. I'll, I'll, I'll get you an answer on that. Yep. Any other board members? There you go, Curtis is gonna save me. September, yeah, so they're looking at uh, demol uh, removing the floor in September, uh, toward the end of September. Uh, looks at roofing, let's see. Remove and replace metal roofing by the end of October. And so, that flooring, between the flooring being complete at the end of November with the roofing in October, it looks like the end of November, they should be finished with January 1, they sh that gym should be ready. Okay. Good. Thank you, Curtis. Thank you, Mr. Positeri. I appreciate it. Thank you. I apologize again. <laughs> you recovered well. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Mr. Houston Lee Rett. I think I said your name right, huh? You got it. <laughs> Good evening, y'all. Uh, I'll start with um, with Broadmoor. Um, at, at present, they're they really are wrapping up. They've got a few electrical items left to complete on the interior, and this project is going uh, along in, in in sequence with the uh, Esser project. So right now, if you walk inside the building, there's no ceiling tiled down the corridors yet. They're waiting on mechanical equipment separate project from the one that I'm talking about. This one has to do with mainly repair to the windows, is a portion of it. Uh, and they're, they're, they should have been done by, with that by now. I didn't so, look today. But, but anyway, <laughs> they're not today, I know that. But um, again, electrical items left to complete. There's a small section of roof over the cafeteria portion of the building that needs to be replaced. It was damaged by storm. And then the, um, the canopies. There's a, a number of canopies that they're waiting for delivery. We had some changes in the, in the layout and they're waiting on delivery. So that should be within the next 10 days. They should have the canopy materials in. So again, that's gonna be a, 
a good coordination uh, issue because they're having to dig foundation footings for each one of the columns where the canopies are. So we're working very closely with Ms. Swallow on that, and it, it's working out well. I think you know we have a plan, a plan of action. So uh, the completion date for that project is September 19th, and they'll be they should be done by then. Awesome. Delcon, uh, they've been they've done good work. Uh, they they're also going to be doing uh, Berg uh, renovation project, which we had our pre-construction meeting today with Ms. Blanchard. And so they're going to be starting. We'll probably issue a notice to proceed in about, uh, well, probably the middle of next week is what we're talking about. So anyway, that's then that's, um, let's see what else. That's, yeah, we're working with Ms. Blanchard on that. And that project is um, minor renovation work. I mean, there's a lot of broken glass. And these are all old windows. And they're having to replace the small panes in some of the windows. So. Uh, that's going to take place. That shouldn't be a problem as far as delivery of materials and that sort of thing. It go, should go quickly. Um, and so West Park is the other project that I'm working on. And we're working on getting a pre-construction conference scheduled for, if not the end of this week, it'll be early next week. And um, we're working with Mr. Grease on that. and. That, that one's going to be the second floor. There's uh, probably more than half of the second floor is going to have abatement. So we have, you know, we're going to have to move furniture here and there, and the staffing is going to have to be re relocated for probably a couple of weeks that we were looking at. So, but again, we haven't really gotten a full schedule yet on that project because it was just awarded a month ago, and we now we have the contracts together. And that's, like I said, we're going to have our pre construction meeting either the end of this week or the following week. So anyway, any questions? Any board members, any questions? Mr. Ogeron, any further? No. Thank you, sir. Okay, Appreciate your you. time. All right. Mr. Craig Abair. <clears throat> Good evening, everybody. Um, our first project is Elysian Fields. Um, we're in the process of tidying up some loose ends on the electrical and the plumbing aspects of the damage assessments that were performed early in the process with um, Elysian Fields being a national project. So a lot of the mechanical systems and stuff was taken out. So we're hoping to have that tidied up and sent in to um, everyone here, project managers in the next week or so. Uh, for review and, and putting out the bid. Uh, the big one, Ellender, um, we've completed the baseball facilities to a certain point. Um, we've reconstructed the new dugout. We've terminated the project. It's been substantially completed. In fact, we just hit the clean lean certificate um, day today. So uh, the contractor will be making application for final payment on that. There's a couple of things just due to age of the facility that we're working on a small proposal on to submit to administration so we can get the ballpark completely functional, um, but we don't expect that to require a lot of work, but we'd like to get them back on their playing field at least this year if we can. As far as the school goes, as you know, um, we're still waiting on FEMA to make a determination on the fate of that school um, but we have had some preliminary conversations and started discussion with administration about looking at what can we do in these early stages to maybe maximize some time if FEMA does move in the direction of accepting um, a complete removal of the school so we're working on scheduling that and submitting that information to administration looking at the different criteria that we're going to need to help us possibly put this school back together or what's the new vision that will be Ellender um, as far as classrooms, um, different functions within the school, knowing what it has being, and it was a beautiful school and it had everything that the students could possibly use and benefit from in their learning environment. 
Um, so just taking a look at what that might mean moving forward. So we're in the process of creating a schedule right now to present and hopefully um, in the next week or so we'll also be presenting that for uh, the first step so we can start conceptual conversations on that while we're in a wait and see mode so we can hopefully maximize some of our time any questions I like that y'all are being proactive at Ellender you know you know thank you very much for, for, for thinking like that let's hope that it gets approved and we can move forward appreciate that uh, mr. Ford so the baseball field so <coughs> Yes, sir. Okay. So it's safe for them to get out there and start playing. They're just not really ready for them to host the NHL. Correct. Okay. Yeah, I was I was actually surprised when they called us about that the other day, but the contractor, what happened was when we reconstructed the batting cages, um, we made a conscious decision at the moment, not knowing what or when they would start baseball again to hold off putting any of those nets and stuff up. Um, and the contractor was very helpful in saying, look, whenever you're ready, we'll put them up. Uh, so all that was done about a week and a half ago uh, at the request of the school. So I think, I think they're probably moving forward now. We have a few little issues with the backstop net, but that's simply those are minor things that we're looking at. Um, and like I said, we're going to present that proposal to the administration very soon. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Thank you, sir. Appreciate thank you. It. Mr. Daniel Bruce. Good evening, everyone. Uh, so, Lakash is up and running. We are working with the manufacturer on a couple of mechanical electrical issues, but, uh, but they're in school using it. Um, speaking with Juliet regularly to make sure everything's going smoothly. So no news is good news. I haven't had any reports that they're ever having issues. So our next priority is to get the Acadian modular building up and running. I think they're beginning demolition of the existing modular this week. Uh, so we gotta go once they get that building out of the way We'll go and confirm a few things, get get a package out, and hopefully have them in that school, that new modular, beginning of January uh, after Christmas is uh, is done. So that's the plan. Um, the modular building company does have line time available for us to produce those modular buildings. It'll be exact, uh, pretty much the same building as the Berg building, and then we're going to modify and you know do the walkways and canopies and whatnot that go along with that building at Acadian. Um, SEC, we're going to move forward with uh, the cottages and repairing and replacing or repairing the cottages. The main building is basically on hold. Honduras, uh, we were going to merge that with Lewis Miller Votec. We're now going to split that and do its own project uh, to get that moving a little quicker. Um, Lewis Miller Votec, we're going to concentrate on getting part one of that was going to be the lift station on that property that was damaged during Hurricane Ida. And we're going to get the lift station back up and running, and then we're going to renovate, I believe it's four of the buildings, and make those four buildings uh, whole again. So that'll be a partial. We're not going to do every building on that site at this moment in time. Um, and that's kind of where we are on our project for hurricane recovery. Yes, Dr. Tron. Uh, question about Uh, when they unload buses and, and, and things like that in the morning? Okay. I, I, I don't know how that's going. The thing that, that, um, 
Good. Good for them. Mr. Ford? I have a question this morning. The uh, South Terrible modular building, and I'm sure the ones at Ellinger as well, there's some, uh, like on the outside, on the back side by the air conditioners, there's some, there's some green, you know, a little bit of, uh, not mildew, but, you know, the, the buildup part as a district. Should our maintenance department be out there maybe pressure washing that, or should our landscaping guy be doing something? Is that something we should be concerned about? If there's some mildew. Have to take a look uh, here. Is that like the greenish on the side of the building, on the siding and stuff? Maybe we Do we know what's causing it? Is the AC the condensate from the AC? That's what it looks like. It could be. I wanted to do the just you know, should we just be painting that, wiping it down, or something? Yeah. So I didn't know. In the modular buildings. They've been in operation a year. I know we were having some uh, some HVAC. All of a sudden, HVAC became an issue at those campuses uh, over the last few days with the heat. Um, they're probably in the process of replacing probably 15, I don't know, Sammy, 15 or so compressors and coils in those buildings. That's at Vesta's cost, by the way. That's not. Just at South Terrible, and there were 13 coils that need to be replaced. Wow. And they were working fine all summer long. Like, as far as I know, they were cleaning the buildings, and then, all, you know, of course, Murphy's Law, school started, and HVAC yeah. started losing. So, uh, but Vesta has stepped up to the plate, and they, were, they, were, they had people out there, like, keeping Freon in the units. I know Sammy's people had were keeping Freon in the units, but Vesta's come and brought their people in to kind of keep Freon in the units and they're working with Bard who is the manufacturer of the HVAC units. It's not just South Tarabona and Ellender, it's like several different campuses that they've done across multiple areas that they're having issues with the air conditioning units. So they're basically looking to the manufacturer of the unit to, to step up and replace coils and compressors and whatever else needs to be done to make sure these things, they're not supposed to only last a year. So. Uh, so Is that a situation where maybe our employees are uh, uh, turning the AC down a little bit more than they should? Um, I mean, when, when it's 103 degrees outside and you got your AC set at 68, basically the unit's not turning off. Yeah. So you probably are working those units extremely hard. So uh, they're not designed to, to, to cut 30 degrees of temp out. So, you, you know, maybe 70, 72 might be a little bit better. Uh, so. And that would be a policy decision on the school board to say, hey. <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, it used to be that way. If I were to run my AC at 68 degrees at my house every day, my electric bill would be sky high, and my unit would be, you know, overused and maybe abused. So maybe we should take a proactive approach and say, hey, look, we can't afford to have buildings. And I'm sure it's great when our electric Certainly, certainly, when no one's in the buildings, they shouldn't be down at 68 degrees. Are those programmable? Uh, it's just a regular stat. I mean, it's, it's 
the ones that came with the building, so kind of thing. It's not something. It's something they designed and you know best is in. So it's just a set it at whatever. There's no lockout mechanism. There's no. So yeah. Uh, A thermostat monitor at the school. <laughs> Just yeah. Yeah. So you don't want to turn them off because then it's going to be no. too much to get don't back turn them up. Off. The don't no. turn them off. Turn them down. Or yeah. up, Raise them up whatever, a little bit. Whatever direction, yeah. but don't turn them off. Right. Yeah. Definitely. Any That's other? I'm saying there should be some recommendations, some guidelines, and you know, for consistent standard. We sent out an email to all the principals to pass on to them, to the teachers and everything, that the thermostats do not go lower than 68. The buildings themselves are like an oven. So we have to keep it cooled. I mean, people are going in and they'll drop it to 62. So I mean, it's like you said, it's not going to get any colder than what the temperature is com compared to outside. They fool with the thermostats and when the, when, the, when the compressor does satisfy the room and the compressor shuts off, they put the, fa the fan on, it stays on, not knowing what they're doing. They think they're doing better with the fan on. When the compressor shuts off, it starts pumping hot air right into the building. So that's how they're designed. And the, the building will heat up in seconds. I saw it the other day. Um, in five minutes, I walked through a room and came back to it, it that, that was set like that. The compressor cut off, the fan was on, five minutes the whole building was wet. The, the papers were curling, it just took five minutes for it. But we did, Sandy did send something out to all of them and uh, hopefully they'll abide by it. And when we get there, when we get the calls, we'll check it. Huh? Yeah. Well, the 70, it was, it's, it's, we're having to find a happy medium with it. 70 is not quite enough to keep these things cool. The doors are opening all the time coming in. So we, we went to 68 just to see if we can hold the temperature in these rooms. And we're having trouble with the AC. So we'll see how it all works once uh, we get everything taken care of. Sorry to butt in. Oh, no, uh, there's a reason we don't have thermostats for everyone to change at all our other buildings. So All right. Mr. Mr. Bruce, I think you have the next one as well. I do. So the security projects, uh, the contractor is 77% complete to date. Uh, went visit several campuses today uh, at Oak Lawn. They just basically have a couple of sections of fence to put up and the gates. At Elysian Fields, they just have uh, to put the personnel gates on and they got to finish the cantilever gate. At Broadmoor, they're going to start stretching fabric today and hang gates over the next couple of weeks. At Acadian, they have not begun at Acadian because they're kind of waiting for all of the demolition to take place to make sure that uh, they don't get in the way of anybody taking a building out. Um, and then they're going to wait till the end when actually we bring the new modular in because we had two sections of fence to kind of close off to the existing modular. Well, now that module is going away. A new modular is going to be coming, so they're actually going to not even put that fence in until the new modular is in place so that we don't waste an alignment of a fence and have to redo it. So they're just going to come back one time and redo that. And then at Honduras, same thing. They had a little bit of fabric left to put in and hang in, hang in gates. So again, they're about 77% complete with that project, and hopefully in the next, they, have, they do have contract time-wise till October 15th, so they still do have about another 60 days on their contract time. Honduras, yes. They've, they've actually got this fabric across the front of Honduras along uh, Grand Cali Road. Um, I think they got all the way back to the building by the sign. And I think they still have fabric to stretch from basically at the corner by CVS to the modular building is what they have left to stretch. And then, of course, uh, from the 
from the right the right side of the building to the property line in the bus loop is what they have left to stretch there too so that should be hopefully in the next few weeks they'll have all the all of that put put to bed so and then we'll, we'll start on to move on to the next batch so okay all right. any other any questions on security project no very good all right thank you mr bruce mm. mr wagon's back again <laughs> should have took him took care of him earlier Hello again. Hi. Um, so uh, I'll make it kind of quick. We talked about uh, one of the other packages earlier tonight, um, which is uh, Lisa Park in Oakshire. Uh, the next step for that is to get contracts signed, and then we'll start uh, get a um, pre-construction meeting scheduled. So we'll start moving on that soon. Um, the other one is um, Caldwell Gibson. Uh, package uh, we had our pre-construction meeting a week and a half ago ish two two weeks anyway um, uh, the contractor is uh, starting to send in submittals and so that work should be getting started here at the end of the month probably um, but it, for that project it's all very um, interior minimum disruptive you know they're hoping to do most of the work on the weekend or in the evening so good it'll be good any board members all right thank you sir appreciate it best report tonight <laughs> mr thompson uh, well we made it through the summer uh we got a lot of work done uh, made a lot of progress very very pleased um so now it's going to slow down a little bit because we're waiting on equipment so and i'll go through each one of them so do large that that was the one that was a little touch and go with the existing chill water system um we got it running got uh, the numerous repairs to the piping done uh that system's holding water we're conditioning the school with it um, we have all of the new ceilings in We've got all the duct work run in the corridors, uh, all the lights up, so the corridors are all done. Looks really good. Um, have the cassettes, the, the new AC units, when I say a cassette, it's an AC unit, in the corridors already. The pads for the condensing units are, are outside, poured, ready to go, fencing is modified. Uh, but we're waiting on condensing units and the indoor fresh air units, which will be in in early October. So basically, the contractor has demobilized, and we're he's waiting on equipment. There's really nothing else to do, which worked out well for you know the kids getting acclimated and before we get back in there. Once they get in, we're going to do two or three rooms at a time and move our way through there. He uh, hopes to be finished by the end of the year and out of there on with the new system running everything demoed and complete so yeah, there's no yep, this yep. December Jan very end of this year so that, that's that's our goal they have more contractually they have a lot more time but they really did well this summer so um, we see no reason unless we have equipment delays that's always the wild card in this we should be able to finish by the uh, end of the year should be a great thing um, mulberry uh we made better progress here uh the same contractor dove had both we he concentrated more efforts on mulberry because we didn't have temporary ac there we had to provide it um they provided some but the school board came in and put some uh window units in temporarily and then we have about 40 to 50 percent of the uh, system remained running because it has its own DX system. So in there, we did all the same thing with the corridors, have all the uh, ceiling tiles back in, lights in, uh, AC units in there, all the duct works complete, refrigerant mains are all run. 75% of the cassettes are in the classrooms already, so they're way ahead of the game there. Um, 
the condensate's done, but the same thing, we're gonna be waiting on condensing units and fresh air units in early October, so they'll be mobilized then also. So they're off, there really will be no more work at either site until October, so. Um, Broadmoor, they have done all the work in the attic. We're running the duct work, uh, made the penetrations. The equipment's coming in in late October for that. So they've basically pulled off of that school also. And when the equipment comes in, they hope to be finished sometime in, in January. If everything goes well, no equipment delays. Uh, HL Bourgeois, all the work is uh, complete with the exception of the large air handling units because we simply don't have them. They're coming in, uh, they're staggered. The last one comes in at the end of January. So they are hoping to put in everything they can in December. You know, during uh, the break, I think one or two are coming in in January and they'll schedule that during, you know, the next break after that, whether it may be Mardi Gras or whatever. The electrical gear is uh, gonna be here that's the only really uh, poor news we have in April. So we're gonna be able to set the central plant, get everything running, but we can't switch over to the new plant until this, this uh, switch here comes in, and that's April 24th. So it is, all the work will be done. We'll, we'll run on the temp system, which is there. And once that gets set, we'll, we'll do the swap over. The boiler system is in and running. Um, so they'll be working outside doing the piping and finishing the fencing around the, the new yard uh, until then. So basically all four jobs, three have been demobilized and HL, they're not working in the school. They did everything they can. And the air handlers that are coming in serve the auditorium, all the classrooms and the uh, old admin area. So they're waiting for those to get here and they're coming in staggered up to January and they'll get those done during breaks. They're not gonna disrupt school. Uh, chillers will be here in late October. They're gonna continue to work outside. So that's kind of an update on everything. Any questions? Mr. Ford? For HL Bourgeois, the, uh, the temporary fencing around yes. where they have the pipe, it, it enclosed the bike rack. So okay. the students that arrive in that bike rack. Okay. So one of two things, we can uh, unbolt the pipe rack to just bolt it to the mm -hmm. student mm -hmm. and move it to a temporary location or maybe just move the temporary fencing okay. to where they can access the pipe rack. Okay. I'll have that address tomorrow. I'll yeah, talk with, to with the uh, contractor. With the number of students walking and riding bikes to school this year, uh, would they be something we can look at to see if they, they've had a few that just put their bikes off the side? Sure. We will get that addressed. I'll, I'll address that with uh, Baloo tomorrow. Thank you. Any other board members? Mr. Orgeron? Yeah, it's a great summer, so really Thank good. you, man. Thank Appreciate you. it. Mr. Robert Utley? Okay. Good evening. Good evening. Brandon Cortez. <clears throat> so I'll give a quick update on the uh, HVAC projects at Elysian Fields in Oak Lawn. <clears throat> at Elysian Fields, uh, Valu, the contractor, is in the process of ordering his equipment and materials. Mr. Uh, Mr. Cortez, can you speak a little closer sure. to the mic? Thank you. Yeah, so as we approve their submittals, they're updating us on the lead times. Right now, they're looking at receiving equipment in November. Uh, no construction has started at this site yet. Uh, over at Oak Lawn, Dove Group's the contractor. They've ordered most of their equipment. Uh, he's receiving his materials. He has uh, a lot of his refrigerant piping stored on site now. Um, he's looking at uh, receiving equipment in early October. Um, they, began, they, they started working at the site over the summer and they were able to do a lot of their abatement work um, to remove some of the piping that had some asbestos. Um, we do have a, a change order proposal from them because they did find an additional 600 feet of asbestos on the piping. So. Uh, that is an additional cost that will be coming. Um, otherwise, the project's progressing, and uh, once the contractors start receiving their equipment, they'll start actually getting some work done. Okay. And Mr. Ford? One question about Oak Lawn. So there was a determination that needs to be made 
whereas the front side of the building, they were talking about moving the HVAC systems to the back side inside the, uh, the corridor, like the area where the students gather. Right. Um, has that decision been made? To, or so we, we, gave, we, we worked on a design to, to move the air conditioning from the front of the building to both sides. We split it up on either side. And uh, we did receive a proposal on that, but we're still, um, you know, we, we gave it over to Becky, and we're, we're, we're kind of uh, in the determination phase of that. It was, uh, okay. it was about 115000 So the for decision that really hasn't been made yet, but we will be deciding on it. Okay, yes. cool, thanks. Right. Any other board members? Thank you, Mr. Cortez. Thank you. Mr. Poisson. All right. Oh, we made it through Hell Week. Uh, Hell Week One. Uh, yeah, Legion was a challenge, but everybody worked together. We got it going. I think John spent the weekend there, didn't he? Uh, it was just a lot of work that had to happen there. Uh, of course, we had uh, breakdowns right before school opened. That was as normal. So, But we got most of that going. Thank goodness to LeBlanc's. Jeff Adams, he worked with us all with the start of school also. Uh, our, th you know, our thing. <laughs> everybody said the updates just about so um, we had to add you know we had the Legion Fields, Mulberry, Oak Lawn we installed temporary AC units till the work gets done with that that went well uh, we put in a bunch of window units mm -hmm. uh, at, at Oak Lawn the cafeteria at Oak Lawn is the AC working there cafeteria yeah Okay. Or so kitchen. I had someone, or the kitchen. Kitchen. The we, kitchen we had a little working. problem with uh, the kitchen. Okay. Half the uh, half was out, but it's been addressed. It's, it's been taken care of. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Any board members? Or oh, were you finished? Yeah. <laughs> I didn't mean to cut you short, but. <laughs> <laughs> Cut me off, yeah. I'm I gonna. did. I'm so sorry. It's just that kind of night, you know. Any any other board members? Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Plasso. Um, before we adjourn, I'd like to. I don't know if I need to make a motion, or just um, would like to add to the agenda the superintendent to give us a report of the first week of school. Do, do I need a motion for that? Or so moved, Dr. Tra Dr. Trahas, to. Uh, to let the superintendent be added to the agenda to give us the first week's report. Second, any public comments? Dr. Trump? Uh, any other board members? Okay, you have the floor, sir. All right, so what, what I'd like to do is, is, is just say this. Outside of morning transportation, afternoon transportation, everything in the middle was beautiful. We had a great first week and a couple of days this week of, of school. Learning and teachers happy and kids happy to be there. That went really well. So outside of transportation, inside that didn't even affect what happened in the buildings, right? They got to school on time. They got home on time for the most part. So our, and pardon me for, for, for the redundancy here, but I, I think I have to kind of take it, as, re repeat kind of what I may have mentioned before, okay? so. Our, our mission is educate, engage, empower every student every day with the focus on educate. Built on that mission, we have part of our vision, vision that says we will teach 100% of our students a guaranteed and viable curriculum. Every kid, 100% of that entire curriculum. That's like a priority, it's our main priority, priority one. When kids are coming late to school, you'll never achieve that priority. Last year, we had kids coming to school consistently late to class. For instance, let me give, just give you a couple of four instances. We have a, we have a group called Employee Representative Committee. <coughs> we meet monthly. Last year, we met every month. 
September, the comment was, with the shortage of bus drivers, are stipends possible for staff to stay late for late buses? That was September's issue they had. Um, October, when will bus issues be resolved? Students are arriving 30 minutes late. November, we are experiencing late buses. Some students are 30 to 40 minutes late, losing instructional time. December, transportation is still an issue. Students are arriving 40 minutes late. It goes on. January, buses are still coming in late. We were halfway through the school year. I heard it all year. We had one of two choices. Do something or just let it ride. Do nothing. Superintendent Leadership Advisory Council. I'm not going to go through all of them, but every month, Buses are very unpredictable, not at all on time. Bus arrival time is not consistent. We heard it from that group as well. So we sat at the table with experts. We sat with transportation, Mark and I, and staff and I, with transportation, and we said, what can we do? Can we keep saying we have a shortage of drivers, or is that excuse played out? I felt it played out. You've got to still be able to do other things other than just say, hey, we have a shortage of drivers. People are telling me, it's everywhere. We know that. We saw the, the Louisville, Kentucky issue. and It's happening everywhere. East Baton Rouge, West Baton Rouge, uh, different districts in Louisiana, 30% shortage of drivers. The question is, what can you do even though that's a problem? Okay, so we tried recruiting. We tried a lot of things to get more drivers in, and we did. But we still were short. So with that said, the first thing we did last year, before we had meetings, we tracked times and we had some definitive times that buses were arriving to school. So we made changes for this year. And we did four things, basically. We did some recruiting. We did community stops, which we know about community stops. We did a no service zone. We had a quarter for some schools, quarter mile, or one mile for other schools. And we made two take-in times on the east side. We went from three to two. That was the things we did. And we changed our whole route system. We put a new system in place. We went from a handmade routes to really digitized routes. When you do that, typically you have issues. We were kind of prepared for that. Then Monday rolled around. Okay? Monday was rough. Rough. And I, we realized that we are not saying that this new system is really wonderful. It was bad. We had a lot of issues with routes. Um, some confusion. So we had to kind of regroup and start trying to fix and troubleshoot. Particularly what Kim was talking about earlier. And Lakash and, and, and you guys kind of helped me with that one. Lakash and South Terrebonne. We couldn't afford to have all these people congested. We had two schools. Daniel created a school for us on, on that campus. We had a larger volume of people coming in. So we looked at it. We had some congestion in that community. What could we do? The school really made some wonderful adjustments, easy procedural things that they didn't foresee, but they made them. Come Wednesday, traffic was flowing like it had always done before school. It took us two days, but that was fixed, okay? We had issues at Bourgeois. Mr. Ford asked me about, about the issues. He gave me some suggestions. We implemented some suggestions. I talked to the SRO today. He said today was the best that traffic flowed in the last two years. The school took some measures. They moved kids that are all coming into the one, look, one central point to the back side of school on Eureka Drive. Made them go to the right or up the bayou. Changed everything. That's things we could do on our end. So we fixed a lot of routes. You guys helped me with that. Staff did a tremendous job. Bus drivers did a tremendous job. Transportation did a tremendous job adjusting. Come Thursday, we were in good shape. Come Friday, let me tell you some, give you some numbers. I'm not saying that everything's great. I'm not saying that. We still have a lot of work to do. And we still have people that are <coughs> giving us good recommendations that we want to listen to. We really want to take their recommendations. We had an email today, I think, um, about communication and things. We've got to get better. We realize that. But with that said, looking at the adjustments, Last year, I told you, we tracked buses. Principals went out there with a clipboard, put it on a form. We had it in one spreadsheet. On average, we had 54 buses late last year daily. 54 buses. 
that amounted to 573 lost minutes. That, that, that's, that's the data. This year on Friday, we had 14 late buses, loss of 98 instructional minutes. We went from 54 late to 14. That was on Friday. I checked it today. We had one late bus today, one. It was, it's tough on people, we get that. These community stops are not easy. The no service zone is tough. We had to address kids coming in late to class, miss the instructional time. Is it fixed? It's not fixed yet, but it's better. As far as loss of instructional minutes, that part is better. The system, we've got a lot of work to do, like I said. There's some things we can clean up. <coughs> late buses, let me tell you this one. This is kind of interesting. Last year, we averaged daily 132 late buses. 132 late buses. They were getting home late. We were hearing it from that end as well. This year, as of Friday, 19 late buses. Went from 132 late. Now this is late meaning they're arriving after the dismissal bell. So the bell rings at 220, they're coming after 220, that's late. This year we have only 19 coming after the bell. I don't know what it was today, we didn't track the afternoon. I'm anxious to track the afternoon. Just, just, so I feel like, like it's making somewhat of an impact. Um, so that's where we're at numbers. I can get into more about numbers, but the main thing, 54 to 14, 132 to 19. Tremendous savings in, in minutes. We're gonna keep trying to perfect that and get it better. That's the state of where we're at today. We, we're, I say we're, I mean the transportation department, Mark's out there on a regular basis checking in with transportation. Is there anything we can do from our end? Supervisors did a tremendous job going to schools, looking, tracking, giving advice, suggestions for procedural things that we do, not necessarily buses, but things we can do to make it better. So with all that said, things like even bike racks, that all makes a difference, you know, little things, crossing guards. Um, you know, we have an SRO in a school, why can't they go crossing guard, right? Those are things we've got to manage on our end. Um, with all this that's going on that happened with transportation, all the adjustments, we're still short drivers. We have, we have 10 vacant routes, 10. When drivers are out, we have routes that are not covered on top of that. So 10 becomes 20 in, 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 in very quickly. 10 might become 30 very quickly. So they're doubling up, they've been doubling up for years, years. I take your route, you take my route, that's how we manage when we don't have drivers, we double up. We've gotta fix that, we've gotta have people on standby, we've gotta have enough drivers to really, really make an impact so we don't have all these vacancies and, and, and holes in our system. So what I wanna ask you is this, I'm gonna ask you that you allow me to come straight to the September board meeting with a salary increase for bus drivers, a substantial one. I'd like to put it on the superintendent's agenda. That way we can recognize the drivers we have, reward them, retain them, and then recruit more to help us fill all these holes so we can make what we have going on even better. And hopefully we can start closing in some of these no service zones if we have enough drivers. We may even be able to add more stops without getting to the point that we're stopping at every door. Once we start getting back to that, we could have all the drivers we want. We'll never get the kids <coughs> on school on time. So I'm asking you if you allow me to do that, I'd like to do that uh, with the full proposal this coming September. So do we need a motion to I, do, I, I don't know if you, you do. No, I just do want not. you to yeah, be okay to if you see it on the agenda that, that yeah. it's Is everybody okay, okay with that? that okay, Mr. Uh, Lagarde. I like what you say, Superintendent, but you know, I got a lot of calls. And I'm fortunate in the neighborhoods I represent that policemen go to some of those houses, they don't go by themselves, they go with a team. And now you're asking a five year old to walk of those houses in those neighborhoods, you know, and, and I think we should, you know, we, we definitely need that, but I wonder how many people is in those neighborhoods 
not at the school, but in those neighborhoods, watching them as four-year-olds and five-year-olds and six-year-olds walk in certain areas. Nobody from the school board was out there watching that, because I was in my district. And, 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 and yeah, I know we got some issues, but we got a lot of issues in District 1 with safety. And if I don't say this, then, you know, it, it really would be bad for District 1. You know, we should do a raise, but I don't want you to, all these numbers, let's look at the end. Because in District 1, my kid's not going to go to school. Let's look at the attendance that we're going to talk statistics. Let's look at the end part, not so early, because what about when it rains? Or what about when they can't walk up? It's just those kids that's not going to go to school. We, we look, we're not taking all the human factor and the safety factor. But um, I'm for, you know, giving a raise and getting drivers. But the community stops are not working in District 1. You know, it's a safety issue. I get calls. Nobody from the school system. Well, yeah, you're getting kids to school. The bus is getting there. But let's look at them attendance. Are the kids getting there? How many kids are left at home opposed to going to school? Let's, let's just start looking at that. Fair enough. You know, but I think, you know, we, we, we need to look at the safety because when you didn't look at the safety factor, you know, if it takes five or six police officers to go to one house and I want my seven-year-old, my eight-year-old, my 10-year-old, my 14-year-old to walk into the neighborhood, <coughs> and a policeman trained with a gun scared to walk in those neighborhoods. I think you ask the kids to walk in those neighborhoods. When y'all scared to go in those neighborhoods at night, but you're gonna ask my kids in the morning when it's dark or it's raining. You know, I, I know we got issues in, in every neighborhood, not the same. You know, I'm getting a lot of calls that why we got east side kids walking more to as opposed to west side kids. You know, I'm getting that call. Like, well, well, the rich getting more than the poor. And as we look at it, you know, I, I can't argue with them because, you know, adjustments are made on the west side quickly. Then on the east side, adjustments haven't been made. You know, and I, I know, like you said, we've got some issues, but let's, let's look at the safety issue first. That should be the main concern that we got community stops or stops at every house or no stops. But you have to look at the neighborhoods that way these kids are walking. You know, now I don't we didn't even put the, the crime statistics in that. You know, it, it probably did, oh, you're going to say where the predators live. But, but do we have where they had a shooting at last night? Go to the sheriff's department and ask them how many shootings occurred at that house or on that neighborhood last night or last week that didn't make the newspaper. And now you got these kids walking by, you know, in these neighborhoods. So that's what, you know, I just had to say that because I've gotten a lot of calls, you know, out of Rhode Island and saw a lot of little kids walking. And I know I would want my kids to walk, but I could afford to take them to school. A lot of parents think they can't afford to take the kids to school. They can't afford, you know, to, to leave them. And then I'm not worried about also at these community stops. It happened. They haven't happened yet, but what about the fight? It's going to happen. We're going to make the news again. Not about a bus. And not, they're going to be fighting because nobody ever watched them, you know? People say, oh, play off is not our fault because it's not at school yet. It's a parental thing. You gotta think about all that because it's coming. It's no one to say that. Okay, Mr. Ford. I agree with Mike as far as making accommodations for certain neighborhoods. We, we talked about that already and you've already expressed interest in doing so. Uh, so I have confidence in you guys. but. I'm looking around the audience and I don't see any of those keyboard warriors that were talking and, and going online and, and tagging board members in their posts. Uh, there are a couple of people that emailed me with actual solutions and, and I appreciate that. If you have a, a problem, then at the same time you present the problem, give me a possible solution because, you know, I hate to quote this guy, but he made something, he said something real profound back in the day and, and it stuck with me, it's Mike Tyson. And he said that everyone has a plan until they get punched in the mouth, you know? And I think that's what we're dealing with over here. We, you know, we can plan all day until we actually face it, and then we have to make adjustments as we go. 
everybody out there has a, has a grief or a problem with, with what we're doing, but very few people are offering up solutions. And, and they were supposed to pack the house tonight, and I don't see one person in here that's not staff, that's not a contractor, or it's not someone uh, affiliated with the school board. So I'm gonna welcome them and invite them once again to come to our board meeting in September, the first week in September, that Tuesday, 6 p.m., come on out and, and be heard. Don't hide behind your keyboard and don't go on social media and start tagging everyone and, and calling them names and calling them out, especially with our superintendent. This man's working his butt off to try to get this together. I mean, I'm tired of hearing it. I'm tired of being tagged in it. Mr. Hamner. Thank you, Mr. Voisin. <clears throat> Mr. Orangeman, as I understand your presentation, you're going for uh, 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 an increase in the number, to, to the number of drivers that are needed. Um, and yeah, because, well, let me back up here a second. I, I know for a fact that, that we train drivers Saturdays during the summer, and they work for us for a little while. And we lose them to parish government transportation system. We lose them to garbage collecting drivers. We lose them to TARC. We lose them to Council for Aging because they pay more. And, and adjacent parishes as well. That's correct. So what you're proposing is to come back into us in September and make us the leaders in transportation instead of the losers. Um, I like that. And that is a solution. You know, we need those drivers. Uh, in my district, it's a little bit different than in your district, uh, Mr. Lagarde, uh, totally opposite. All they want is a bus. The community stops are fine, but they don't have a bus that can show up in their neighborhoods consistently and on time. And the travel time from one end of the district that goes from Highway 90 all the way to the Civic Center uh, and picking up kids you know, on Savannah Road and then going downtown to pick up to go to the same school, it's not, it's not working. And uh, the, the routes are great. The, the, the drivers are, are wonderful, but they just can't make it with, uh, without some additional drivers and buses. And we have buses. We have empty buses. We just don't have man, uh, manpower to fill them. So uh, I, I think by making us the, uh, the leaders in transportation instead of uh, the, the, the last on the list with what we pay our, uh, uh, our, our bus drivers, and please come with a big one, okay? Because we need them in Mr. Lagarde's neighborhood for those reasons. We need them on the east side because they're going from Cocodri to, to, to up the Bayou or from Point of Shan to up the Bayou. And uh, this Benoit needs them in her district. Mr. Ford needs them in his district. Uh, we could all probably name bus routes where we need another driver um, to, to, to get those kids to school on time because uh, I, I know three routes where if it wasn't for the fact that the parents were taking them to school, those drivers would, we'd, we, we would still have a mess. You got a mess because they can't take them. We don't have the mess really over there because they're not taking them. They're, they're taking them right now, but they don't, they, they really want their bus and that's all they really get from us in that district is a bus. Um, so I'm going to support whatever you come up with. Uh, on, I just wish we could do it before sept you know, September 1st because we got a mess still. Even though I, uh, you know, we're we're taking it on time and we're letting out on time, we're still not getting them to uh, uh, to school, offering them the transportation that they need, um, and we need to give them that transportation. So I appreciate your uh, uh, candor on all that and uh, can't wait. We're going to get those drivers. Dr. Trump. Oh, thank you. Uh, first of all, I'm 
first of all, I'd like to, uh, excuse me. Let me put on my mic. I want to thank the transportation department and all the staff and uh, all the workers because uh, you've been a tremendous help to me in the last week and to the district and, and Mr. Osher and his staff. Uh, I know uh, to speak to Mr. Lagarde's uh, point, I, know I dealt with one, uh, excuse me, that was a wrong word. I assisted a, a mother that called me from, that lives on Norman Street. And uh, she said that uh, at that point there, it was still a no service zone across Grand Kai Road when we first started that Monday. And uh, we have parents calling me saying, well, I don't have a car. It's not like I can just be late for work and get the child to school. I don't own a car. I can't get them to school. If I don't have a bus or a bus stop, my child can't go to school. And uh, I felt so bad for that lady when she called me that day and I'm thinking, She's not alone. There's a lot of others that didn't call me that's in that situation. And uh, the transportation, Ms. Ogeron helped out and the established stops in those communities uh, in uh, East Street, Norman Street, and even right across the road from Oakland where there were no stops, because that's a five-lane highway. You can't expect kids to drive. And uh, with the timing of the school changes, it was really impacting. Uh, parents who both work to get and trying to get to school on time I mean to get, get to work on time and still have their kids brought to school safely it was it was a challenge to get a new schedule going for a lot of families and I know because I have a, a daughter that teaches at Montague Middle has to be that 720 and a, a pre-kid a kindergarten a pre-k kid that don't take the bus till 830 <laughs> so grandma to the rescue but she has me a lot of people don't so uh, I really want to thank uh, the, the, everyone that helped out in getting to this, where we are now. A lot, it's a lot better. We're not there yet. We know we still have a lot of problems out there. And I do agree we need to uh, look at co communities according to that particular need because communities are different. And uh, we're, we're gonna get there. We're gonna get there. And we, we, we're making fast progress. And, I have a, uh, and, and I'm glad what, I'm happy that we are where we are and that our kids are in, in school now instead of waiting on the bus and being late, getting home and late getting to school. Thank you, Dr. Trump. Ms. Benoit. Um, thank you, Mr. Barzan. Yeah, I, I just want to applaud uh, Mr. Ogeron and the Transportation Department, the, the staff that have worked so hard to try to find solutions for all the transportation problems. Um, I sort of in, in the same situation in what Mr. Uh, uh, Hamner said, I, I've gotten a lot of complaints, but most of my complaints are not about the community stops. They don't mind that at all. They understand it. Um, they just want a bus to be there on time uh, at the time they say they're going to be there so that their kids don't miss the bus because that's, that's happened a lot. Um, and they want their kids at home as early as possible after school and I think you have done a lot of good work in trying to get uh, those things ironed out we have tried to get bus drivers for two years we have signs all over the parish big signs asking for bus drivers we have not gotten all that we need if this is the solution I'm definitely in favor of more money for the bus drivers and I'm hoping that this is a solution that's going to draw more CDL licensed folks here to help drive the bus and, and, and get all of our kids to school on time. One of the things that I do want to mention, you talked about the, the missed um, uh, instructional time because of late buses. I'm sure you did measure the non-public schools that we also transport. They were also getting to school and missing that's right. So we had a lot more instructional time that was lost because of that. Um, I think there's some things that we need to do to protect the bus drivers and um, not to get into the, the things that we had with um, the fights on the bus, but things need to be addressed with that. And if it's to protect bus drivers so that they don't have to deal with that, we need to think about that as well. I think that there's, I've heard in public that people that have maybe thought about driving a bus don't want to deal with what's going to happen on the bus. You know, they don't want to, they don't want to get into a fight. They don't want to break up a fight. They, 
So we need to think about policies that are going to protect the bus drivers, that they're not going to be weary about taking a job uh, driving the bus. That's another, I think, um, solution in trying to, uh, to get more people interested in being bus drivers for us. So that's all I want to say. Thanks. Okay. Motion to unless you one quick yes sir thing. go ahead so in conclusion thank you for um, supporting that that offer um, for for a September meeting but I, I want to thank I, I, there there are no parents here Mr Ford but thank all of our parents for adjusting making an adjustment that was huge we appreciate that so much and, and we want you to know we we understand. What, what you what you're what you're doing some of the adjustments you've made we, we, we get it and 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 we still want to hear if there are things that we can do better we still want to hear so if there are solutions and things we can do uh, specifically we're, we're open to hearing it's simple uh, give us a call set up a little meeting with us and we'll, we'll sit and talk through situations that we, we can fix we're about fixing things so uh, we're, we're very open so thank you all for, for that uh, this time and appreciate you all staff for uh, everything you do as well thank you there being no more business for BFT uh, we'll adjourn thank you thank you thank you everybody <laughs>